two, one. Hey guys, this is Bruce and welcome to Combo Courses Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about uh, open topics basically. I've got a couple questions people ask me, so I'm going to start off with a couple of those questions. And I see you guys on TikTok. Thank you guys for joining me before the podcast even started while I was messing around with trying to fix this thing. But right now I'm going to go to some questions I'm going to answer on, look at me trying to figure out TikTok live there. <laughs> All right. I'm going to switch this camera. Bear with me, guys. Um, I will get back to questions for everybody. You know, this is going to be like an hour long, hour plus sex session. And uh, just see, this is why I was trying to avoid right here where I'm switching this camera back and forth, which I hate, hate doing this. All right. And it doesn't even look good. Okay. Anyway, let's get started. So I had a question. Somebody said, this is from Alex. Wait, is this the first question? Hold on. Uh, first question is this one. Okay, I think this is the one. So Alex is saying, hey, Bruce, how do you get this type of role? Were you able to already, were you already a part of a company and then got permission to work internationally? And he's talking about, I did this video where I've talked, I'm, I'm uh, working remotely as a cybersecurity guy. And so let me speak on this for a little bit and just kind of tell you guys what I, and I already explained this to, to him, but I want to share it with everybody. So I'm going to do that real quick. All right. So what I've been able to do this a couple times in a risk, in a cybersecurity role. And just to let you know, you can't do this with every job. This is not... This is not something you can, especially with cybersecurity, there's not every job you can do this. And let me just like tell you a couple roles that you're not going to be able to do this. Like if it's most government roles, even if they're 100 percent remote, um, it's going to be difficult for you to travel outside the country because they'll have restrictions in certain countries you can't go to. Um, and then some of them, some jobs you have to be in a skiff and some have a, like a flexible thing where you have to, you have to be in the state because they want you to go to the, if, especially if it's classified environment, you've got to go to the state to, uh, you have to be in the state in order to go to the office every now and then because they have a classified system or something like that. So most government jobs are not going to allow this. Um, and if they do, there's restrictions, but really every organization, that's another point. Every organization has some sort of travel restrictions. Um, now, that being said, what I did on these two jobs that I was able to travel on was one was was a government position. But what I did was I just let them know. I said, hey, I'm going I'm going on a vacation. So what I did was I took my own vacation, but I took my laptop with me. I made sure it's OK to do that. I looked through the travel restrictions and everything, make sure the country I'm going to is not on the bar because there's like a banned sanctioned list that you can't take any kind of government equipment or any kind of technology to those countries that is owned by that company or that or that government agency. So I made sure that that was good. Once I found out it was good by the travel policies and all that stuff, I just let them know, hey, I'm going to be in this country, X country for, you know, a week. And then you say, OK. All right. And then all I had to do was let them know that I went there and then I was on vacation for the first like couple of weeks. And then I actually worked one week there. Like there was a week where Cause I don't, you know, they only give you so much leave. They only give you so much vacation time. So what I would do is I would just take all my vacation time, like or two weeks of it. And then I would take, I would work what from there, you know, and, and the hard part about that is that you'd have to coordinate the time zone difference. Like I'd have to wake up at 3 AM so I could be awake for the East coast time to be a part of some meeting. And I got to make sure my, my network is good. I'm in a secure area and I got to make sure that, um, uh, that my that I can communicate with them on teams or whatever I'm talking on zoom calls or whatever it is. So that's, that was one situation. Another thing I've done is I'll be between jobs. If I'm, if I'm going from one job to another, I'll quit this job, take a month off and then be looking for a job as I'm in overseas. <laughs> this is insane by the way. And then uh, that way I have a whole month or two, or whatever, how many months I want to take. Four months is my max. That's that's the most I've ever done, which is crazy. And don't do that unless you have another source of income, which I do. So I was off for four months and then I finally got a job. And then 
you know, when I came back home, they sent me the laptop and everything and I'm, I was working. And now I'm in a job where I can't really travel because the organization doesn't want me to take their equipment so I can travel. But it's be on my own time. I can't take their their laptop. Another position, the best one I had was it was like a part time job where I was I was a technical writer for them. And I was writing um, cyber. I was writing cybersecurity policies and then like I was helping them with their security controls and then writing it and making sure everything matched up and things like that. And that one didn't require me to do be anywhere. I could be anywhere in the world and work. And that was probably the most money I've ever made, to be honest with you, per hour. And those guys, as a matter of fact, the, my leader, my my manager, he was over in Ireland hanging out, traveling, doing meetings with us from Ireland and traveled back. I guess he had some family there. And then another guy, my coworker was from India. So he was like traveling went to India and hanging out with his family and stuff. And then came back like we were all like <laughs> they were all traveling and stuff. And at that in that point, I was the only one home, but I could have been overseas or did whatever I wanted. So these jobs do exist, but there are restrictions. One of the restrictions is that government jobs, most government jobs won't allow this. If you're in a secure environment, like classified information, they're not going to allow you to do work from another country. I mean, and then there's also restrictions. Every company has restrictions. So another thing you can do is before you even get the job, if it's remote, make sure it's 100 percent remote and then ask them questions about, well, what if I was to travel over here? Could I would I be able to work from this country? Ask them flat out. You know, and they say no. OK, well, you got a decision to make. So you can do both. You can do like you're already working in that position and you can ask them, hey, can I travel with your equipment? I would like to work from there. Or you could be like before you even get that job you know, make sure that it's OK. So that those are two things, a few different options for you. And, and those are things that I've done before. So I hope that that helps the question. Um, let me see. I've got a question on YouTube and then I'll take some from TikTok. Morgan says, if you were in college right now, what field would you go into if money was your only motivator? If money was my, in theory, if money was my only motivator, <laughs> Um, uh, let me see right now. What's hot. I could tell you right now is if you wanted to get a job fast and make a good amount quickly, it, there's a couple things you can do. There's a huge def deficiency in cybersecurity. So cybersecurity is one thing. Another one is cloud. Those two things. Now people are talking about AI and prompt engineering, and it's so exciting and all that stuff. But that that industry is kind of just now starting to rise. So I'm not. I'm certain people are making money off of it, but I cannot speak on that. And I'm telling you, for 20, from 20 years of experience, and then the last five years, cloud computing is freaking super hot right now, and they need people to do it. Um, and then cybersecurity is another one. That being said, what you need to do in college, which what what I tell everyone to do is get experience now and start your resume now. If you happen to be in school, if you're getting out or if you're about to go in, start your resume immediately. And like, even if you got no experience, what you can do, and if you know, even if you're not in college, check it out. When you put your resume, when you do your resume, right? Now, first you want to write it on paper. Just write your resume, like not on paper, but, you know, get a template. If you need a template, I got a free template. You can borrow, you can take that template. It's free. Go to com. It's in my link in description, comicourses.com. Go to the free resume, download it. It's an ATS style resume. It's a real resume that I've been using for years. Take that template. Take how I worded it. There's a, the top section is like a summary. Do a summary of like what your objectives are, what kind of skills you have right now. Or if you have none of that, don't, you don't have to have a summary. And then skills. Like if you have any skills whatsoever, put those on there. If you if you're planning on starting a college, you could say that you've enrolled in XY college to get a bachelor's degree. You could put in there working on a certification, working on my CISSP, working on my security plus. You know, you can put that stuff on your resume and then put all the skill set. Even if you don't have skills does not require you to have experience. You can just if you happen to know how to build a computer, put that on there. If you know happen to know how to do networking, you can put that in your skills. All of those can be put on your ATS style resume. Now, once you get your resume, what you want to do is put it on LinkedIn, create your profile on LinkedIn, dice.com, create your profile on dice.com, and then monster. At the very least, those three, but you need to put it on like 10 different places. This 
profile is more important than anything you're going to put on Facebook, anything you're going to put on, um, I don't know, TikTok, anything. This is money. These are places you can put your your information, your skill set, your college aspirations, your certification work. You can put that on there and people will contact you and say, hey, do you I've got this job here. We Listen, right now, we do not have people to do this work. I'm telling you, I know that there's layoffs in Google. I know the news is talking about layoffs at TikTok and because they, they post that because it's sensational. It's like, oh, look at this. You know, everybody look at this thing here, this shiny object. I'm telling you. This industry is hurting right now. We do not have enough Americans to do this. There's so much so that a lot of very smart, this is what I admire about um, um, about people coming from other countries, is that they're willing to do this work. And half the time, more and more, I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of um, of foreigners do this work. <laughs> not foreigners, uh, foreigners, but also. Um, uh, people from other countries, you know, who want to become Americans like they are, are Americans, first time Americans. They just got here a year ago, two years ago. And they're that's why I admire about them, because they're smart enough to take this choice and, and make those hard decisions to say, you know, what, I'm going to get into this thing. So a lot of times I'm working alongside people from Jamaicans to people from Laos, people from Vietnam who are new Americans or people from, you know, Barbados, or you name a country or, or, or an island, they're here and they're doing this work that Americans don't want to do, you know? So like the jobs are here. So, and, and they pay really good too, by the way. So a lot, unfortunately. So that's what I would do if I was in college right now, if money was no, uh, no object. It's as far as what, what classes to take, it's, it's pretty arbitrary because you don't have to do any one thing to get into cybersecurity or in, to get an IT period. What they're looking for usually is a degree in um, in science, technology, and engineering and mathematics. I would do one of those courses. I would do I, information technology, a bachelor's in information technology or a bachelor's in information systems. And the reason why is because those are easier certifications. Computer science is awesome. Engineer, electrical engineering is awesome, but it's a lot of math. And it's, it's sometimes they have a lot, they have more courses for you to do harder and more. So, so I would, what I would do if I was in college, I would take an information technology or information systems degree. I get that piece of paper while I'm working on a certification, I'd work on a security plus, and then I'd, I'd be already applying for jobs as I'm in college. And that way, once I got out of college, I would be able to get myself a, a, a job with experience. I'd already have experience. Or I would, uh, you could get experience while you're in college. So that's what I would do um, if if I was had to do this over again. You don't specifically have to do cloud technology. You don't have to specifically do cybersecurity. But if you can lean forward in those, then those were two that that are a really good idea to do. If you happen to be very good at mathematics or logic, software engineering will be easy for you. So you could probably do a computer science. That would be a good one. Um, and people look up to people who have computer science degrees, especially if you're not a program. It's it's a good certification to have, but it won't, ex you know, if you don't have it, it won't exclude you from a job. So that's that's what I would do. I would take one of those IT job um, um, bachelor's degrees. I would go for that and I would start applying for jobs already when I'm in college and then try to get a job even before I get out and do like a part time work and then apprentice work or something like inter internship, anything. Hope that answers your question. OK, let me see. Get a lot of college students uh, who follow me and stuff. And I'm I'm not ignoring you guys on TikTok. I'm about to answer some questions right now, but I got so many questions. And you guys see Turtle and all you guys are already, there's a lot of people on here who are goats. Like, listen to these guys. These guys know what they're talking about. So I appreciate you guys answering questions for me. Um, there's, there's guys on here who have, who got me beat. So listen to these guys who know what they're talking about um, in the comment section. All right, so get a job as an IT desk. Yeah, thanks, Cuban. I appreciate that. Let me see. I'll have a Security Plus, a GSEC, a GCIH, and probably a GCIA by the fall with no experience. What? What? To, what do you? What do I do? I guess that's your question. So first of all, the GCIH and the GCIA are are. Um, Really, really good certifications. 
really, really good certifications. Just with those alone, you should be able to get a job pretty fast. So what I would do if I were you right now, Lost Boys, is immediately put my stuff on um, on on LinkedIn. I'd start working on my profile. That's what I would do. LinkedIn, dice.com, monster.com at the very least, but you should put it on like 10 different ones and put on there that you're working on your GCIH, your GCIA, your, your security plus. Put it on there because there are employers who are looking for people with a GCIA. And if they can find somebody who's going to have one in six months or going to have one in seven months, they'll sometimes they'll hire you. Sometimes check this out. This is crazy. Sometimes organizations are looking for, they're looking for you. They're looking for somebody who has a GCIA. But if you say, I'm going to have one in six months, seven months, whatever, they'll they'll take a chance on you. They'll bring you in. Now, it's going to have to be an entry-level position. So you said, also, I start the uh, SOC internship next week. Yeah, there you go. That's you, You're on your way. So that's exactly what you want. You want that experience. Now, once you get in, learn, be like a sponge, learn everything you can, man. And especially look for those guys who are the goats. Like look for those guys who are who are on fire, who, those guys who know what they're talking about. And then use them as your mentor because that's what I did. So um, when I w- went into for a while, I switched gears from GRC to cybersecurity analyst work, that, which is what you're about to do. And um, I didn't know I hadn't done any of it. I mean, I was a geek. I'd learned. I knew all basic stuff. And I'd had hands on with networking and stuff like that. I had enough experience to where I knew, you know, what I was doing. But um, I, so I would just shadow somebody who really knew the GCIA guys, you know, the, the people who knew how to do network forensics, I would follow them. And then they would walk me through like exactly the process of how to do everything, how to do incident handling, how to how to what kind of patterns to look for with certain data that was coming through on arc site now before for since i was able to get men to have mentors there and they know they were my mentors i just followed everything they did they told me something it was gospel man i was taking notes they were talking to me i'd be like uh-huh a word okay okay all right how do you do that again i'll be taking notes that's what you want to do Take as many notes as you can, learn everything you can, be like a sponge. You know, even those in the guys you want to really seek out are the guys who don't want to teach. Like those guys, if they sit you down, they can't teach. Like half the IT guys can't teach. They'll get on and they'll just be like, look at their commands. They won't tell you nothing. They'll just be like, look at their commands or watch what they're doing, copy it. Right? Be like, okay, they wrote that down. All right. And then go like, Type it on your like do it by yourself, like copy what they're doing. You know, <laughs> that's that's what I did, man. And I ended up being a pretty good uh, a cybersecurity analyst. You know, I ended up learning uh, our seam, the seam that we had there. I learned that how to build it. I could I learned how to build it from scratch. This is how deep it went. I'd never done any of this before. But within a year, I knew how to build a seam system from scratch. That's a that's a security incident event manager. And then run data through it and create the content for it. I was able to do all that just from listening exactly what I'm telling you. I was a sponge. I, everything they did, I made it. It was my. It was gospel to me. I, they were telling me, I'm like, all right, all right. I'll be taking notes. I'll be like, oh, hold, hold on. Let me get my notes. You know, and I would listen to everything they said, man. And, and to this day, some of those guys are still my mentors. I look up to some of those dudes that are so smart, right? Regardless of, you don't want to get, don't get involved with like, the the internal politics of it or you're there to do a job you know what i mean like you respect what the person knows and not necessarily what the person believes off work or whatever you don't have to be their buddy or anything but respect their their skill set right and that's what i did i respected this person's skill set and sometimes it went beyond that and we became friends or whatever but really it was about their skills their knowledge you can't take nothing away from a person's knowledge and skills and so that when you latch on to that person who's your mentor, then there that's the best teacher you can get. That's better than a book, better than any of that. So hope that helps you. Uh, let me see. Let me answer some more questions on, on YouTube. Thank you guys for joining me. Let me see if I have any. Somebody asked me, how can I get started in cloud with with a bank mortgage lending background. 
Um, so one of the best places to start, uh, let me show you a good common body of knowledge that you can try to start with. In, anytime I'm talking to somebody who's in a whole different, hey, Joe, thank you for that, for that uh, bonus, man. Thanks for that five bucks. So anytime you get into a new field, um, anytime somebody asks me and they're from medical industry or whatever industry, I always tell them, like, you, you got to figure out if you want to do this because you might not want to do it. So to start off with in cloud, here's a really good certification. It's called um, AWS Cloud Practitioner. This is one of the top certifications um, in cloud, AWS as a whole. And if you like this, once you do that, and this is not a huge investment. Look at this. This is it's a 90 minute course. It's 100 bucks. And the training is all is a lot of training is, is in here. I think they have some on Coursera or whatever. But look at this. You got free exams. You got practice information. It's going to teach you the basics to see if you want to do this. It's just like if you were if somebody said if I told if I asked you, Joe, hey, I mean, I want to learn mortgage lending. Like, how can I? learn it right you would probably be like look here you tell me the basics and you and then you probably say okay shadow me to see see what i do and see if you want to even do this because you might not want to do this anymore so and that's the same thing i'm telling you is like just check it out first and this is a great way to to invest in yourself check this thing out and figure out if you want to do this you're gonna have to at some point learn basic information technology okay that just means the common body of knowledge for basic information technology. You'll find that if you want a source for this. Let me see if I can find a really good book, uh, a good resource for you. And it's not it's not going to be expensive. You're going to invest in yourself more and more over time. One of the ones that I suggest people do is called the A plus, um, the CompTIA A plus. If you really don't know anything about IT, it's a good common body of knowledge that uh, a really good common body of knowledge that's really good to start called CompTIA A+. plus. Bear with me. Let me just bring it up here. This was the reason why I, I suggest this one because this was my first certificate, one of my first certifications, and it was helpful in that it taught me the terminology. It taught me the basics of what I need to know in hardware, networking, mobile devices, operating systems, software troubleshooting. It's going to teach you basic stuff that you really need to know for this industry. And then from there, you know, it, it'll, as you're learning the common body of knowledge, the cloud stuff will make more sense. So you can, th that's where I would start off, Joe. I hope that that makes sense to you. Let me see. And then you ask, uh, I was laid off in February. The only thing um, the only thing I've started looking into is GRC. I did a lot of credit risk analysis due to lending rules. And I have some, I have to learn some HIPAA and, D, and, and PCI DSS. Okay. That's a really good start. So PS, PCI DSS, um, is going to be helpful for you to put on your resume. Those are things that you can, you can actually add to your resume and, and, um, and, and before you actually put it on your resume here, here's what you can do. Here's what I would do is I would like look at this PCI DSS. PCI DSS has a website from the people who created it and they have a bunch of resources. So what you would want to do is look through their website and learn what you can about the you want to get a big picture understanding of how it works. And so actually, there's a better site here. PCI DSS security controls. They have a set of security controls. So what I would do if I were you is I would learn those security controls and then I would put I would reference the security controls in reference in and also cite my experience with PCI DSS. So you have a legit experience that you could put on your resume. So this this talks about a big picture of all of the all the requirements and everything that you would want to put on there. And so at, for those who are listening or on TikTok, what I'm showing right now is all I did was went to Google and typed in PCI DSS security controls. And it's I'm looking at a, a blog that's talking about the control objectives. There's better resources than this, but this is a really good start because, look, it's breaking down the objectives of security controls. 
maintain and, and uh, maintain a secure network, protect payment and credit card uh, credit card information from the holders, maintain vulnerability management programs. This is the same stuff you see in risk management framework 800, ISO 27001, HIPAA, all of these. There, there's a certain common body of knowledge that is used across the board for best security practices in every industry. And if you don't have it, that's why you hear about people getting hacked and stuff. It's, they're getting hacked because they're not using these, these basic things. I know it, it sounds very simple, but that's that's what it is. It, when you look, when you read the report, Uber is a good example. So they've talked about Uber getting hacked. And so Uber, so Uber, this 18-year-old or 19-year-old dude broke into Uber and was able to use one of their admin tools to kind of take over their servers. And uh, the dude was just trying to make a point. And lucky for Uber, you know, this dude didn't, he wasn't like really malicious, but he was able to get in. And the way he got in is crazy. When you read the report of how he did it, Uber basically wasn't doing what they were supposed to do. I mean, actually, maybe not even Uber. It was like one of the employees was like what they did was they had a a um, a server that wasn't protected and had like a shared shared files. And in one of those shared files was a, a tool that they used to change change accounts or something like that. And that tool had an admin password and username in it. It was just something that they could easily just go in anybody, not anybody, but the administrators could go and use that tool, change what they needed to change and get it. It was a way to make their life easier, but they just left it on a shared server that other people had access to. This hacker got in. He was able to the, check out the way he got in. What he did was he... He kept sending, you know how you get those notifications of people trying to access, when you try to access your bank account or any kind of account and it sends you a multi, a, a link back saying, hey, here's your code. Uh, do you want to allow this place from this person from this other place to get in? And normally it's you, right? Google does this. Like when you try to get in from a place it hasn't seen, it hasn't seen before, it'll send you a link and say, hey, do you, is this you? Like, do you want to get in here? Right. You've seen that. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's like a multi-factor authentication thing. He kept he found somebody's account and he was able to put in their their username and and then kept sending that link to them. And that person hit the link to say yes. And then he was able to get in with the admin's account. And then he was able from there, he was able to get into their server. He was looking through their server and then he found that tool and then he used that tool. to. He just escalated his privileges over and over again. And if had they done basic security practices, they would have had a secure network. They would have had uh, the guy uh, would have had training enough to know, hey, I don't know who this is. I don't know where this who where this link is coming from. Who is this? that would have been enough for them to not get hacked. I mean, even if the guy was able to get into that, use that guy's email, he wouldn't have, they wouldn't have that tool out there because basic security practices would have prevented them from doing that. So yeah. So best security practices, is what you need to do, Joe, going back to what you're saying. So one thing you can do is put that on your resume, put your HIPAA experience on there, put your DSS your uh, PCI DSS experience on there, put all that in there and then that'll help you out. All right. Let me, let me answer some more questions from TikTok. I get some complaints on TikTok because I'm answering questions too thoroughly. <laughs> They're like, Hey, why is this guy still talking? <laughs> I'm trying to answer the questions, man. I mean, this is not, a, this is not for TikTok. It's not a, like a TikTok forum. You know what I mean? Like this is very deep stuff. So it, like this is for people who are trying to change their life. This is not just for entertainment. So, you know, that's that's what's going on here. All right. Uh, Cuban says, uh, most companies are understaffed and expect a group of eight analysts to secure a company of a of 1,000 to 2,000 employees. Yeah, Cuban, my man. So there's some people who here know what they're talking about. Like I could tell like you're in the industry if, if you've experienced this kind of thing. And that's what I mean. Like we need people. Like every, every company for the last for the last six, seven years that I've gone to, um, doesn't have enough people. And right now I'm, I'm in a place I'm, without saying too much that I'm the only dude doing, man, I don't even want to talk about it, but they don't have enough people to do the work. Let me just put that, let me just put it that way. 
And every place I've gone to has been the same thing. We don't have enough people to do this work. Just like Cuban said, they got eight people working for a company that has a thousand employees, two thousand and and three thousand computers. So we really need people to do this work. And if you just do put this stuff on your resume like you're supposed to, right, and show a willingness to work, sometimes you don't even need experience to get in there. You have to know the knowledge. You have to do the hard work of knowing the knowledge. Like I'm not telling you to go in cold and not know anything at all about IT. You got to know something. And I'm giving you resources so you can go and start learning it if you if that is your if that's the case. And even if you happen to be a help test person, you're trying to level up, man, this is a perfect opportunity for you. This is a perfect opportunity for you to double your income because this work that I'm telling you about makes way more than help desk, way more than help desk. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, I don't I don't I don't know if I qualify. You do. If you have help desk experience, you have security experience because that means you've applied patches before security patches you got to put that on your resume you've done vulnerability management but i haven't done management like vulnerability management means applying patches and you're a part of the vulnerability management process you might not be the manager but you're part of the man vulnerability management process which is what they need which what we need in this field you just got to put it on your resume right these these uh help these um Human resources people, they don't know our job. They don't know what to ask. They don't know. And some of the technical recruiters, they're not technical. They don't know our job. We got to put the key words on a resume so that they know we got to spoon feed them. But I'm telling you how to spoon feed them, how to tell them what to put on your, like what they're looking for. Because these these technical recruiters are only looking for key words because they don't know our job. They don't know risk management framework. They don't know PCI DSS. They don't know HIPAA. All they know is the Keyword. So you got to put that keyword on your resume. Put it multiple times on your resume. Put it on the top in the summary. Put it in the experience. Put it in the skills. They can't miss it. And then you want to post that everywhere because they're mostly on the job sites. That's where they go and look. Right. And then the job sites, sometimes the job sites feed into and out of their actual company company databases. So you want to be on those job sites. Thanks for that, Cuban. I appreciate that. Um, let me see. I have an IS degree. What certifications should I get to start my journey in information in, and in security? Um, ones that I would recommend to start: Security Plus. Security Plus, hands down. If you're if you're new, Security Plus offers two things: common body of knowledge. CompTIA Security Plus. Type it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go to Google. Type it in. It offers two things. It's a common body of knowledge to teach you all the basic things you need to know about cybersecurity. Um, everything from risk management framework, uh, compliance, the stuff I'm talking about, this like, what the hell is this guy talking about? That to hacking, to software upgrades, to network security. It talk, it kind of touches on each thing. And then once you get the certification, it's highly marketable. So that's why I would highly recommend Security Plus is the first one. If you want to go a little bit deeper, and if you want to specialize, there's other ones you can take. CEH, if you want to be a pen tester, to start, to start now, to start. And the reason why I say CEH is it's not like the premier hacker. You're not going to be a, you know, Edward Snowden or something suddenly by, you know, you're not going to be a genius from, from CEH. <laughs> it's, just, it's just very marketable. So that's why I say CEH is really good. It's very marketable. Once you put it on your resume, people know, have some idea that this guy knows you know, and like I said, those technical recruiters, they don't really know. They, all, they know CEH just has something to do with hacking. That's all they know, right? They don't know the difference between GPN and it's, they don't know what a GPN is, but they do know what CEH is. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I say CEH is what you want to put on your resume. But so Security Plus, the first one, I would say if you're entry level, and if you want to specialize, be like CEH if you want to do pen testing. And if you want to do GRC stuff, you do the, uh, the ISC2 CAP, also uh, now known as the ISC2 CGRC, which is what I have. Um, that's another one if you want to specialize in, in um, compliance. What's another one? Entry-level security. Those are the first one. I mean, those are the ones I would recommend to start. Um, so I hope that helps. Uh, let me go back to YouTube here and answer another question here. 
Jill says, I was laid off in February. Okay, I read that one. Okay, uh, Jill says, right now I'm learning about SOC 2, and I have two years of knowledge with the NIST SP-800. That's that's great, Jill. Put, you need to put all that stuff on your resume. So, Joe, what you want to do is, first of all, go to link in description uh, or go to com, um, com, uh, combocourses.com, link below, and then look at my resume. So my resume has a breakdown of how you should word it. And uh, you want to put you want to use that style of resume. It's called ATS style resume. And you want to put all that stuff, everything you're telling me, like your HIPAA experience, your HIPAA knowledge, your HIPAA experience, your DSS knowledge, your DSS experience, your skills. Your SOC 2, learning SOC 2, your experience with NIST 800, all that. Any kind of hands-on computer stuff you have when you were working at the mortgage company, man, put it on there, man. Even if it's like, even if your computer was off, <laughs> if your computer was off and you, you like had to figure out how to get it back on the network or something, like put that on there, man. Like put it, put it on there. Um, you want to put any kind of experience you can just it's the way you word it and make, definitely put the keywords in there. And when you do the interview, be honest with them about, you know, be about your experience. I was a mortgage, mortgage lender, but when I was there, I did have to help them fix the rent network once or twice. You know, I'm an entry level person, but I'm trying to learn. If you show willingness to learn when you get in that interview, dude, I've hired people based off of that willingness to learn. I want somebody who's willing to learn more than I want some kind of smart ass coming in there who knows everything. Right. And it's not that I'm afraid for my job or anything, but it's like every organization and every situation has a whole different process. And if you get somebody who's not willing to learn and are, are not flexible and they have a fixed mindset, meaning they don't think that they you can't change them. And this is a problem with some older folks, you know, is that they don't want to change and you can't have that kind of attitude in that environment. Like you need somebody who's flexible, who has a growth mindset, who's willing to change and willing to like, if you show that willingness in the interview to learn and tell them flat out, I want to learn this stuff. I want to go deeper. I want to grow with a team of people. You say those words, then that's the stuff they want to hear. And so they will hire a guy who's very willing to learn with uh, less experience than they would a very experienced person who's a, who's a hard-headed, uh, egocentric, uh, arrogant dude who knows everything and if they do hire that guy they're gonna really regret it because those guys they're so difficult to deal with uh okay thanks joe for that question i appreciate that let me see god dang i got so many questions and stuff going on on tiktok um i would love to start but i don't know where to begin and that's coming from razor's edge um, so if you really don't know where to begin, if you really don't know where to begin, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, all you guys who've been in this field for a long time, um, I would start off with just free stuff, free, free resources, go to YouTube and just like start to kind of look around and what you want. Like, look at your software engineer guys. There's guys on YouTube who are, who are that's their profession as a software engineer. Look watch with watch their videos subscribe to them start watching their videos to see what they say about the pros and cons especially look for videos about pros and cons of working in that field look for the pros and cons of each one i myself have a youtube channel combocourses.com where i talk about the ins and out of my field which is security compliance there's good things and bad things about it Cybersecurity, for one thing that's bad is that you got to deal with people's shitty attitudes all day long you know, like you got to deal with not all day long, I would say, but sometimes in meetings, people get in their feelings about stuff. You know, it, it can get very stressful because they had a data breach and people are freaking out and it's like, damn, what do we do? Or I have to I have to be the bearer of bad, bad news sometimes. And so people get it. Sometimes you got to I got to deal with difficult people and difficult customers. So that's that's one side of cybersecurity people don't talk about. But that is, think about it. Cybersecurity is dealing with hacking, data breaches, upgrades to systems. These things all cost time and money. And when you're talking about people's time and money, when you're talking about their time and their money, they tend to get a little bit emotional about it. So <laughs> that's why. But anyway, like, so what I would do is if, you got to figure out if you want to even do this because this is not for everybody. Cybersecurity, I know the money sounds good. It's very stable. You know, I'm good. It, there's a recession going on. The last two, three recessions, I've been good. But 
there are pros and cons to it. And it's, I would say it's not for everyone. Not, not everybody has the patience to learn it. Not everybody has the patience to deal with this stuff. And so that's why they pay us more. That being said, if you feel like you can tolerate it, if you feel like it's something you can be passionate about, something you can do, you don't have to like it. I mean, as long as you can do the work, if you're willing to do that. Uh, I would start with YouTube and, and look up, um, start off with software engineers. Look for real software engineers talking about the pros and cons. Look for real cybersecurity professionals look, talking about the pros and cons. And there's many different aspects of cybersecurity. So look at look at the hackers. Look at the pen testers. Look at the... Um, Look at the security compliance people. Look at there's a whole huge field across the board. Look at your help desk people. That's probably when you want to start. Start off with help desk. Go to Google, YouTube, type in help desk pros and cons, cybersecurity pros and cons. Um, name an industry, network engineering pros and cons. These are all different branches of information technology. You don't know if you want to do this yet until you listen to people who have been in this field for a time for some time to figure out if you even want to do it. Cause it's not, this is not everybody's cup of tea. All right. Let me see. Cuban says hundred percent. You have to be dedicated. You have to dedicate a lot of time. Security is changing monthly. Yeah. Some, some of the technical aspects of the security and, and it all, it changes quite a bit. So um, there's pros and cons of everything. Is a, is a computer science a good way to enter the field? Yeah, absolutely. It's computer science is a, it's a great way to enter any aspect of IT you want. Computer science degrees are kind of a couple of the premier certif- um, degrees out there, actually. So it's a great way to enter. It's not the only way. Now, some people will have you thinking that you have to get a cybersecurity degree to get a security job, and that's not true. Some people think that would lead you to believe that you have to have a computer science degree to have a software engineering or whatever job. No, you know, you have to have the experience. So what the companies are really looking for is a, a typically the experience first. That's really comes first. But then next in line would be a degree because they have like requirements, but the requirements don't tell you. It has to be from Harvard. It has to be a master's degree and it has to be a computer science degree. No, it says a computer. They have to have a, it'll say something like either associates or masters or bachelors, right? And it'll say an accredited college. And then it'll have say usually something in STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. One of those mathematics. That's one of them too. Let me see. Going back to YouTube. Whoa. Hey, YouTube. Let me see here. Joe says, um, I'm not looking for six figures as I don't believe I've earned enough skills for it. I do not have certifications and I'm in college right now. Yeah, Joe, that being said, man, um, you can still land yourself a position making pretty good money. Um, and you said, uh, but in order to stay here in Bell, uh, Bellevue, 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 Washington, um, I have to make about eighty-five. Um, and I don't know the I don't know the uh, range there. I don't know how how easy it would be to find a, a job in Bellevue, making eighty-five, especially with no experience. I mean, we could look it up real quick. Let's see. It might take you a minute to get there, if I'm being honest. Let's, let's look at LinkedIn. If you guys didn't know, I have a LinkedIn page. I, I put the link in description if you guys wanted to join me on LinkedIn. Um, I pretty much I don't. I pretty much join everybody. So what I'm gonna do here is just switch my page. If you want to find me, it's uh, go to LinkedIn. Just type in Bruce Space C I S S P Space R M F, and you'll find this page right here that I'm showing on my screen. And uh, we can talk like sometimes I'll, I'll be out shopping and somebody will pop up a message and, and we'll, I'll start talking to them on on LinkedIn <laughs> or something, you know. Uh, so uh, here's here's my page right here. Let's look up. Um, let's look up. Uh, let me see. What are we looking for? We're looking for a IT job um, 
entry level no how what can we say support it support and um we're gonna look for jobs and we're gonna filter by location is let's just say washington washington state i'm i'm assuming bella bella view is washington state washington united states okay let's see what the jobs look like here experience level is going to be internship let's say entry level internship so no let's yeah let's stick with those right there we got about ten thousand positions open we probably want to look by the last month because that brings it down to six thousand we don't want stuff that's already taken so here's some jobs right here in washington we're looking for like a job that's around eighty-five thousand. um but yeah there are some jobs here that are entry level type positions. What I would do is I would apply for for all of them. You know, I'd put my I have to put my resume up. What do you have to lose if if they just say no, right? Uh, okay, move on, move on to the next one. Um, so that's that's one place you can search. Another one would be Indeed. Indeed has a better search function, in my personal opinion. Uh, but let's look for IT. Let's look for IT entry level support. Let's say support. It comes up with the actual keywords that it suggests. So that's kind of cool. You can do this with just about anything, by the way. Let's change the city to, let's look for Bellevue. Bellevue, Washington. There it is right there. Let's see how many jobs total. 240 jobs. Oh, my Lord. That's not a lot. That's That's not a lot. Um, what are they paying? So they got some eighty thousand dollar jobs, but not not a lot. So there there is some stuff here, but I don't know. Okay, hold on a second. Wait, right back. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So let's see, where are we? Bellevue, we're looking for jobs posted within 25 miles. Let's actually expand, expand it out to 35 miles. That really didn't help us at all. <laughs> that didn't help at all. Okay, let's look for entry-level positions because Joe is looking for entry-level position. There's still some stuff here. Um, there's some that are within the $60,000 to $80,000 range. Uh, but if you have no experience, more than likely it's going to be a job like this that's making $30, $38 an hour. But you said you have some experience, so you could probably pull off one of these higher paying jobs. Um, I believe this is the this is the U.S. Navy right here. <laughs> They're trying to sneak in there, man. Uh, okay, here you go right here. Look at this. This might be up your speed right here. I would just go ahead and apply for a job like this. Look at this. I only need a high school diploma for this one. You might be able to get in this. This is an $80,000 job right here. So there looks like you have an opportunity, Joe. I hope this helps, man. Might be able to do it. Might be able to pull it off. Good luck to you. But that's how you search. That's what, how you do it. Um, you can also look for those jobs on Dice. I would look on Dice, Career Builder, Monster, and you want to definitely want to put your resume on each one of those places, right? That's that's how I've been able to get these jobs. You know that that's how I do it. Exactly what I just showed you is how I do it. Eighty-five to start is tough, not impossible, but tough without experience. Yes, that's absolutely true, especially depending on the org on the. On the location, the location, like if you had been, if you'd said, oh, I'm in the DMV area, you know, that's D.C., Washington, Virginia area, then that's a whole different ball game. Like 85 is, yeah, you could probably get it. But Washington State, I don't, I'm not sure about that one. That would be difficult to do. Like Cuban just said, he's right. That's hard, but not impossible, but you can do it. 
especially because you said you have a little, you have some experience and then you have a lot of knowledge. So it's possible, but you want to like really work in any experience you have is what I would say on your resume. And don't, you know, I'm not telling you to lie in the resume, but if you've ever fixed a computer at your job in the mortgage company, <laughs> you might want to put it on there. You know what I mean? Like embellish it, you know, don't lie. But like if you help them fix the network or you, you something like that, you want to like word it to where, you know. All right. OK, I got a couple questions here. Um, thank you, Joe, for that donation. I appreciate that. He says. Um, it's, it's not much, but I want to support and say thank you for everything you've done and you're doing. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. All right. Um, Mr. John says, uh, what, what are your opinions for risk management framework 2.0? What are you noticing the great areas? What, what are the areas of updates? from the previous. Okay, I've answered this one before, but since you donated to me, my friend, which I very much appreciate, let me show you real quick. So the biggest changes for the NIST 853, if you guys didn't know, 800, NIST 800 Risk Management Framework is a government's GRC. GRC is governance, risk, and compliance. It's making sure organizations are um, in line with different industry, state, government standards, things like if you think that that's irrelevant, think of any time you go to a bank, they also have to have GRC. If you ever go to the only thing that's, that's helping us to function as a society and and you know have all these perks is GRC. To be honest with you, it's not talked about, but if you go to Target and you put your credit card information in a system, that's GRC as well. So government has to protect our systems with GRC. Two, and they use something called risk management framework or NIST 800. It's just a series of controls, security controls, security features that you have to have physical controls, um, privacy controls, uh, making sure that everybody in the organization has multi factor authentication, uh, things like that. So that's what the NIST 800 does is it breaks all that down. And then it breaks down not only the security features, but a process of how it does it. And so his question is, what are the changes between they, – they recently had an old one called – it was just Risk Management Framework, NIST 837. But now they have a, a ver new version that came out like th two, three years ago or something. And now the, or the everybody's doing it. The differences are the main thing I, that I see that has changed. They have switched some of the controls around, but the most significant thing that I noticed is that Number one, they added a new step in there in the process. Let me just show you what I mean by that. They added a new step called prepare. This is something we've all, all been doing already, to be honest. It's something we, we already kind of do. Whenever you start a new process, you're going to prepare to do that. And the preparation phase, um, this is not a good image. Hold on. I need to put my own stuff on here like before. My own stuff used to rank on here and then it, you, you could see it better. Okay, there we go right there. Let me switch on TikTok so you guys can see what I'm saying here. Do a quick little GRC lesson. This right here is the process that's used for GRC and um, governance, risk, and compliance. And an organization is supposed to go through all these steps right here. In, in the previous version of the government's GRC risk management framework. You only had categorize, select, implement, assess, authorize, and monitor um, that you have to go through when you set up a new system or if you have an old system. All of them go through this process of engineering. They go through this process for maintenance. Everything they added this right here. Prepare is an one one of the new features. This prepare phase is something we already really do. To be honest with you, so prepare is like getting in contact with all the points of contact, telling them, hey, we've got to do um, assessment of the controls. I'm just letting you guys know, or, hey, this thing's going up for authorization, contacting the firewall guys and saying, hey, I need all the, let me get the rule set. That stuff has to go into our package so we can send that forward. Or, hey, we've got to do some monitoring of the controls. We've got to do a scan on Thursday. Preparing is contacting people, finding out who is involved in this, get, um, 
getting all the stakeholders involved and constantly going in this process. That's preparation. It's something we already do, but they added it in this in this process. So that's one thing that they changed. Another thing is that they added a lot of stuff on privacy. What you'll find is privacy is integrated throughout the new process. As a matter of fact, the whole name of the new one has changed to privacy. So it's NIST 800-37V2, uh, right? A Rev2. And so the name of it, the whole name of it has changed to this. This is the new name of it right here. It's Risk Management Framework for Information Systems and Organizations, a Lifestyle Approach to Security and Privacy. So throughout the document, this document here, they they talk about pri they integrated privacy from the very beginning. So they don't sep before they would separate privacy in this own little basket in this own little box. But now when you go through this, whenever they mention security, they'll mention privacy as well. And the reason why they did that, which was a very important uh, change, is because I mean, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because whenever whenever I'm doing assessments. I'm not going to just ignore privacy issues. Like if I notice that an organization has you guys, your social security, and I'm looking at a bank and they, they have their social security numbers on out in the open for all to see, you know, that's not good. Or if I'm in the government and I see classified information just laying out on a desk that has people, a list of people's names on it. Privacy is a sensitive information. So privacy, to, to answer your question, number one, they added a whole nother step, which is preparation. And then another thing they did was they integrated privacy throughout the whole. Uh, they integrated through the whole process, through every part, all the controls reference privacy in some way, shape or form. If it has anything to do with it whatsoever. So those are the main two things, like if any takeaway that you have from it, if you want to know more about it, if you read the the new and you don't have to even read the whole thing. But as you read through it, you can get through, get to chapter two. And by that time, you'll be like, OK, I, I see what they did here, you know, because it's privacy, this security and privacy, security and privacy. So those are the main things that, that that have been changed. I hope to answer your questions, John. Thank you for that donation, by the way. Uh, let me see more questions. Thumbs up. Dan, 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 driving man. Thanks, man. Thanks for all your support over the years, man. This dude's been. <laughs> supporting supporting me for years man thank you for your support dan dan i appreciate you man um were you in the air force yes i was in the air force for uh for about eight years where i was um i was a security forces member doing started off as a weapon specialist in like montana <laughs> montana of all places mountain montana and yes, I was the only black person within a thousand mile radius in Montana because there's only there's more deers than there are humans there. Um, but yeah, so I was stationed in Montana and then I got I was post I was traveled the world in the military. And then I cross trained. I changed my MOS. I changed my job in civilian terms to uh, communications, which was a huge, great move because I'm, I'm more of a better fit for that. And learned how to do help desks was where I started. I did some network engineering. I did some. Um, I did a uh, big one was um, certification and accreditation, which is what I'm talking to you guys about now, which it changed to risk management framework. So, yes, the answer is yes. Military police. Yes. Another name for security forces is military police. This man knows my whole history. <laughs> Dan, Dan, how you doing, man? And Dan, Dan, weren't you in the Army? Okay, let me see. Um, let, one more question here on TikTok. Somebody said, I'm doing, I'm doing the CYS Plus certification. You think I can find a job when I'm finished? Um, JP, if I'm being perfectly honest, man, yeah, you can. You can find a job, but it probably won't pay what, you, what you're thinking in the beginning. All right. So in the beginning, you got to pay your dues just like everybody else. You got to learn the industry. Right. So you're probably not going to out the box make 100,000. It's very uncommon to see that kind of thing. I know people talk about it and, and, and there's an exception to every rule. However, when you first start, typically 
you know, it's going to start off at very humble beginnings. Um, so can you get a job? Absolutely. Uh, make sure you there's a few things that you need to know before you start applying. Number one, I would you could just start applying right now. Get your resume together. Put keywords on your resume. Keywords that you want to put on there is that you're actually working on the certification called CYA+. Another thing is any kind of experience dealing with computers, you want to put that on there. Any kind of skills you have, including the skills you gain from CY+, you want to put that on there. Any kind of other certifications you have that are related to cybersecurity, related to information technology, put that on there. If you went to school and had any kind of training whatsoever, any kind of, even if you didn't get a certificate, put that on your resume. Put it on your resume, okay? And you, even if you're like, you're probably like, Bruce, well, I don't I don't have experience, man. I, I'm, all I have is the CY+. Plus. That's fine. You want to do something. You What we're trying to do right now is advertise what you do have, all right? So you don't have to be perfect. And the way that people are finding, the way that they're finding most people these days is to go on the job sites. The job sites is where all of the instructors are going. Um, the instructors, where all the um, the human relate, um, the HR departments are going, it's where all the technical recruiters are going. It's just the easiest way to find people. So you want to put your stuff and create a profile on those sites, and that's LinkedIn, Dice, Monster. That's why I keep mentioning it because it's the best way to actually show yourself. Put your stuff out there now. They need to know how can they find you if they don't know who you are. Like you've got to put who you are and what your skill set is. And they're looking for people at every level. They're looking for apprentices. They're looking for uh, people who just got out of college. They're looking for people who have 20 years of experience. They're looking for every aspect, but you got to tell them that you're out there. So that's, is there a chance that you can get a job? Absolutely. Will it be the kind of money you want? Probably not in the beginning. That said, it kind of depends on where you live, but you got to post your stuff out there. Security, CY, A plus is great. If you're probably not, you know, it's probably going to be in a in a in a job you don't necessarily like in the beginning. But remember, it's steps. You'll get there, but you got to take that first step and put your stuff out there first. Like right now, you need to do that right now. You know, so that that's that would be my advice to you, man. I hope that helps. Uh, let me see. Lagging just a little, but not bad. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um. Let me answer some more. Do you have projects on your resume? Um, what kind of projects do you mean, Cumin? Oh, some, you're asking somebody else. Okay. Thanks, Cuban. By the way, thank you so much for answering other people's questions. I got like 100. I, did, I can't answer all these questions. So I appreciate all you guys who are um, in this field already answering questions for other people. Really, really appreciate that. Because that's the name of the game. We're just trying to help each other out to level up, you know. And Uber still doesn't have security positions. So. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Answered more questions. Most of the most of them are PM people, but aren't very technical. Pro project management people. Are you referring to Uber? Project management is a great position to get in, by the way. The project management, if you guys were wondering, um, those are the people who shadow a lot of the large technical uh, projects. And they're helping us to manage um, manage all the tasks and resources to get a job done. And it pays very well. And they, they don't have to be technical. So that's a really good that path to get in, especially if you're older like myself, but you're just getting in this and you're trying to find something better than being a teacher or better than being a nurse or something. And you're you're like, I need something that pays project. Man, you don't want to learn all this IT stuff. Project management is something you should really look into. Um, Jojo says, how long does it take to get a CompTIA A plus certification? Really depends on your study. Because there's no time limit, um, you know, it's for me, I can just tell you how much long it took me to do it in the military. They gave, they sent me to a boot camp. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't you don't have to do this, but 
and and boot camps are very expensive. So they literally spent thousands of dollars for me to go to boot camp. Looking back on it, you don't have to go to a boot camp. You can literally just get a book from Barnes and Noble or Amazon or something, and then just buy that book and then study it. Depends on your study to answer your question. For me, after the Air Force sent me to a boot camp to learn A plus and we crammed it into my brain after two days of study. Um, it, I took another two or three months to study on my own, and then I took the test and I passed it. So for me, it took about two or three months. It doesn't have to take you that long. Um, it depends on your study habits. You could you can do it at your own pace. If you're starting from scratch, it's going to be a little harder. If you come to you. A plus is going to take hard. It's going to take you longer. But if you starting from nothing, it's going to actually feel hard because you don't know the terminology. You don't know like all this stuff is new to you. So it's going to be difficult for you. Um, I was, you know, it's probably going to take you a few months. Security plus security plus is based on the knowledge that you get from security from the A plus. If you are already in this field, if you are already a, a geek, like a hardcore geek, you built your own your own computer, you can fix your own laptop, you know how to remove viruses, you've just been doing this for a long time, you could probably just go in cold and take the security plus. Well, you'd have to study, you probably wouldn't go in cold, but you could study for the sit for the security plus, study for like a month or two, and you could probably take it and pass it. Um, but security plus is usually for people who already are at a certain level. You know what I mean? But if you're take if you're going in cold, like you don't know nothing, nothing, A plus is gonna be hard. CompTIA A plus is gonna be hard. I know because that was me. Like I I mean I was kind of a geek, but I wasn't really building my own computer. I wasn't, you know, I knew some stuff and I I would learn on my own, but I wasn't like really hardcore in it. So A plus was actually difficult for me. So, and that was after me taking a bunch of classes in computers. Uh, a plus was 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 the first certification I took, and it was a little difficult. So I would say it depends on what what level you're at and um, how hardcore you you you're willing to learn on it. Uh, let me see. Jojo says, "Man, I'm." I'm, I've worked in Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and Regions. I'm a mortgaged. I'm I'm mortgaged out, and now trying to network my butt off to get in tech and find and finish my computer science degree by 2026. Man, Joe, you have a plan, man. This is more than what this is more than what most people have. You have a plan because that's where it all starts. So the fact that you already have a a plan to actually finish your degree by 2026. You can put that on your resume. Uh, the fact that you um, already know PCI DSS or even what that is, which is amazing because most people do not even know what that is, to be honest with you. Put that on your resume. Um, anytime you work with PCI DSS, anytime you've protected people's P uh, HIPAA data, anytime you've anything you've done, put it on your resume and start now. Start now. Put your stuff on your resume and then put that ATS style resume up on Dice, Monster, and, and LinkedIn at the very least. I would suggest if you're serious, if you're really serious about making money, if you're really serious about doing this, put it on like a hunt, put it on the top 20 site. I'm not joking with you. Put it on at the top 20. Once you get your resume tight, like get it solid, put it on like the top 20 sites and you will, somebody will contact you about a job. It probably you don't want to take the first thing you get offered, um, but you will get offers, man. You it will work. Trust me. <laughs> this is the part people don't listen. I say it over and over again, and do not listen. I'm telling you, that is it. That's the secret sauce. That's how you do it. I got books that walk you through all of this stuff. I literally walk you through the entire process. I thought about, it, sat down, and said, "What am I doing right?" Because I'm obviously doing something right. I'm I'm not. It's jobs are not hard for me. I money's not hard. Listen, relationships are hard. Okay, I'm on my second freaking divorce. Like for me, it's hard. You know, being a father is freaking hard. I'm a single father of two. It's hard. No, it's not hard for me. You know what is not hard for me? Finding jobs. 
Finding jobs and making money is not hard for me. That I know how to do. That I can tell you guys how to do. So listen to me. Take your mother effing resume and post it <laughs> on those sites that I told you. In fact, do it on 10 different ones and it will work. I'm telling you, it works. Buy my book. Check out my book. Go to Amazon.com. Uh, type or you can go to convocourse.com. It's there. It's I've got one you don't like reading. Listen to the book. It's an audio book. It's an audio book. It walks you through everything that I do, everything I'm telling you here. I'm walking you through this book. Let me show you what it looks like. This I cannot stress this enough, guys. Like this, it really, really works. Computer, cyber, security, jobs. It's on Amazon right now. You can also find it for cheaper on my website. But if you happen to be on Amazon, you got some free credits or something, let me show you. This is the book right here. It's a whole series of books. I tell you how to... And if you follow me on my newsletter, sometimes I give these books away for free. Real talk. Follow me on my newsletter. I give I have opportunities all the time. I tell people about jobs, um, all kinds of jobs, uh, jobs where you're working from home, jobs that are making six figures. Follow me. These are my books right here. This is it. This is the one that you if you get this one, this whole series right here. I've got a bunch of discounts coming out real soon. I just haven't had time to put them together, but I'm about to be giving away a whole bunch of books, a whole bunch of discounts from my own personal site once I put all that together. But if you want to get it right now, this minute, and you prefer being on Amazon, here you go right here. These are the books right here. These walk you through everything I'm telling you about right now. Everything walks you through it, the whole process. And I have a course that literally shows you the screen, screens where I'm showing you exactly what to do step by step by step. If you're serious about this right here, listen to what I'm telling you. Listen to what I'm telling you. Put your resume on all those sites. Do what you can. Put your you got to put the keywords on the resume, okay? Um it can't be just a blank sheet. Like you got to put but if you if you don't know what to put, you need an ATS style resume. ATS stands for application tracking software. It's just a very basic format. And if you want a template of that, you can go on my link in description, link below, go to com, um, com, combocourses.com. You'll see a free downloadable of my real resume. You can download it. Look at how I word, worded stuff. You don't have to have 20. I have 20 years of experience. I got all these certifications. You don't need all that stuff. What you do need to do is use that format. The format that I'm using there is what you need. You don't necessarily need the summary part. The summary part is just a way for you to put all your experiences in one place. It's, it's like a cheat. It's like a cheat code, but all the rest of it, the format of it is what you need. All right. I hope that helped. Let me answer some more questions. What are your thoughts on military learning cybersecurity? I'm kind of stuck on active duty or National Guard. I'm kind of stuck on National. OK, Jonathan, are you still on? I would like to answer this question, but you said. What are your thoughts on military learning cybersecurity? I'm kind of stuck on active duty. I don't I need a little bit more information because this is me. Like I was in the military and I can answer this, but I, I don't quite understand what you're asking me. So if you could rephrase this, I mean, I could take a crack at what I think you mean. I think you mean what are my thoughts on a military person learning cybersecurity? I'm kind of stuck on active duty on the National Guard. Hmm. I'll wait for you to to uh, rephrase that question. I like to answer it correctly. This is a career and passion move for me, man. You, Joe, you're in for a great you're in you're in for a great um, path, man. This has been a great path for me. It, for me, that's the way it started. It started off as a passion. It started off as something I really wanted to do. It started off as something I knew was going to make my life better. And all those things happened to be true. And everything and more, like everything and more happened because of this career path. You know, um, because of this career path, I 
things happen in my life, man, personal things, but um it's 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 amazing when you have money um how much more stable you are mentally to deal with those hard things. Everybody has these problems. I'm not exempt. Nobody's exempt from these problems, but it's great that you, I don't have to worry about that stuff cuz this job I don't have to worry about working. You know, it's one thing I don't have to worry about. So 99 problems, but a job ain't one. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's pretty corny, huh? <laughs> um, if you're having job problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but a job ain't one. Somebody needs to contact Beyonce's husband and, and um, give me a contract. Okay, Joe says, uh, I look at the cons and trust me. I've yet to see any tech person say that they've been called a black redneck like <laughs> what? Like I get called in mortgage. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but that is hilarious. <laughs> you just made my day, man. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. <laughs> a black redneck. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> oh, man. Just made my day with that one. Um, do you do you think a CCNA is necessary before focusing on cloud? Um, seems seems like a strong networking. Um, seems a strong networking based is needed. Um, no, CCNA is a whole nother level, my man. <laughs> CCNA is hard as hell. Is no, 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 no. Okay, so let me let me see if I can find a pretty good. You don't have to have super. Okay, so how do where do I, how do I explain? It? I used to have a CCNA. This is why I know this question. How do I explain this? Okay, CCNA is like. Um, let me see if I can show you like what goes into a CCNA. That's, that'd be the best way to explain what C So C CCNA, while I'm typing this, CCNA is a Cisco Certified Network Associate. And uh, it's one of the entry, it's not like really an entry level certification. It's pretty hard. Curriculum, I don't know how to spell. So CCNA is, is specifically it's a vendor level certification. That's another thing. So vendor level certification is like um, it, it means like one company is putting that forth so you can learn their product. They don't care if you learn like you have to learn the basics of networking. But when you get a CCNA, you're learning how to do it on their product. And unfortunately, there's no good, in my personal opinion, okay, my personal opinion, there's no good vendor agnostic um, network certification. I know some people are thinking, what do you mean, Bruce? It's, what about the network plus? I said good. I said, did you hear what I said? I said good certification. <laughs> no, I, I have the network plus, um, CompTIA network plus. Okay, let me see. It's not very marketable, but it tells you the basics. That's about the extent of the network and stuff you really need to know. Network, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to find what goes in the CCNA. Okay, here, here's something. This is a little something right here. So what goes into a CCNA looks a little something like, a little something like, it goes a little something like this. <clears throat> if I could switch my screen real quick. So see this? These, these are the modules of CCNA. So CCNA is focused, number one, it's a vendor level certification. You got to know their system, how to, how to navigate on their products. And you're going to learn um, intro to networking, right? That's what you're looking for. So you probably just get away with a network plus or something like that. Um, but they're talking about the components, the models of their systems, routing and switching on their systems. Of course, you have to know essentials, but you have to do this on their system. And then scaling networks, 
uh, network, and I hope this is accurate. This might be outdated or something. I'm, I'm looking for like something that's a little bit better. So bear with me. This is not my field of expertise anymore, but uh, I know a little something. So you're going to learn network fundamentals, switching technology, WANs, infrastructure, but it's all with their technology. It's very, very detailed, very deep, and it's not an easy certification. Um, what you could, you could just do the network. To be honest, you could probably just do the network plus. Let me just show you. Network plus will probably be a better network plus CompTIA network plus. It, again, it's not very marketable. It's not the best certification. It's not going to win you. It's not going to win friends and influence people. It's not going to make you money necessarily. It's, it, you know, it's, it is what it is. You know, it's, just, it's the CompTIA network plus. So, you know, it's not a security plus. It's not an A plus. It's a network plus. And this is very basic. Um. And unfortunately, there's nothing better out there that's agnostic on networking, but it's going to tell you the network fundamentals. <clears throat> it's going to show you the network fundamentals, uh, network security, network implementation, network operations, network troubleshooting. Very, very basic, very basic stuff. If network, I would say CCNA is is if you're trying to be a network engineer with Cisco products, then you want a CCNA. A CCNA is one of the best certifications out there, to be honest with you. It's a, if you get it, I'm, I'm not telling you not, not to get it. You can, but if, you're, if your goal is to get a cloud certification, you don't need CCNA to do that. You can get away with a, a network plus because you need to know basic networking stuff to do cloud. CCNA is not basic networking stuff. It's um, it's virtual networking. It's VLANs. And I believe they split it off into different parts. I believe there's a network CCNA security and a CCNA virtual or I don't know. So CCNA is if you're is for network engineers who are doing working with Cisco products and they're trying to ad advance as a network engineer. That's what I would say. But if you're doing cloud, you if you know, if you have a basic understanding of networking, it's going to, you'll be all right. You know, until you get into the more advanced stuff where, where you're doing, I don't know, uh, virtual networking or something, you know, and that's maybe you would need a Cisco CCNA or something like that. Yeah, I'm that, I don't know. That's beyond my expertise. That's just my, that's just my two cents, um, Jay. Just, that's just my two cents. All right, let me answer some more questions on TikTok. Uh, let me see. Do I need a master's or an associate's degree <laughs> to make six figures? Um, that's a pretty that's a stretch, brother. Do I need a master's or an associate's to make six figures in IT? Um, I hold a security plus in GRC. Any recommendations? Okay, so the reason why I last is because that's a pretty big gap um you what do you need so there's a few things that lend themselves to get into that six figures um one of them is location and somebody said you don't need either that's true um you need a friend who can hire you i wouldn't say you need a friend so here's here let me i'm gonna walk you down a laundry list of things that can get you in the door of six figures number one location if you live in the DMV area, a lot of those jobs are pretty good. Uh, are a lot of them are six figures? Six figures is not like a lot there. Like if you make a hundred thousand, that's not that's not a lot there. That being said, if you make a hundred thousand, you know, like you, there's some places in, in that area that's hard to even survive with that kind of money. To be honest with you, but. Um, so yeah, location helps helps out because those jobs typically hire people at a higher amount, like 85, 75, like it's nothing to, to make that kind of money. Uh, so that's one thing, location. The other thing would be certain clearances. Um, you, this is not saying you have to have a clearance or have to be a, a U.S. citizen 
or be eligible for a, a secret clearance. But a secret clearance active, top secret clearance active, active with uh, active security clearance with a poly, uh, a poly lifestyle. Those all lend themselves to six figure territory. Um, that being said, you high have to have the skill set along with it, but you don't have to have as much skill set if you have active clearance in those in, and if you live in Washington, that area. OK, so now let's say you don't have none of that. You don't have a clearance. You don't have you're not living in Washington. You live in Omaha, Nebraska or something like that. Uh, somebody said an OWASP, ISSA, ISACA meetups develop. OK, no um, certifications. Let's talk about certifications. Number one. CIS is professional level certifications. All right. So there's different tiers of certifications. Like earlier, we were talking about security plus and a plus and network plus. Those are entry level certifications. Great for if you're starting off. Once you level up to a professional level certification, which are harder to get and usually require that you have five years of experience. So those are things like the CASP, the CI, the CASP from CompTIA. That's a six-figure certification. CISSP from, uh, from ISC2 squared. That's a six-figure certification. CCNA. CCNA, you're, you're talking about six-figure uh, area. CCNA. CCNP, also six figures. Uh, anything above a CCNA, six figures. Um, what else? <clears throat> what other certifications? Help me out here, guys. A VNP, a, a VCP. From um, from um, uh, VMware, these are all professional level certs. They're all like six figure area. I would say C C E H, certain cloud certifications, all that all that kind of stuff. Those are all six level six figure certifications. Another thing is experience, and this is the biggest one: experience. Oh, G. Somebody said G Sec. Uh, I don't know, but I'm not sure about G Sec. Uh, but I know G C I A, G C I H. Um, security plus could with experience. Let's talk about experience. Experience six figures. You're talking about couple years of experience, depending on what field you're in. With a couple years of experience, depending on the field, you can. I can tell you in GRC governance, risk, and compliance. If you're an auditor, if you happen to be a security control assessor, if you happen to be an information system security officer. You happen to be if you've done this for two years, you can get yourself six figures. You can that that's six figures territory. Another six figures thing is if you go overseas, th there's a lot of six figures because people don't want to move overseas, but it's also tax free. So it's actually pretty dope. Um, another thing is you, you talk about de uh, degrees. So let's talk about degrees. Degree, six figures, bachelor's degree and above. Um, bachelor's degree and above that doesn't guarantee that you're going to make six figures because normally they want you to have experience. So experience is king. But the thing is, if with a bachelor's degree, even with two years of experience, you can get six figures easy, maybe even with one year of experience, depending on the job. And then another thing is the organization. Some organizations don't pay less than six figures. I mean, well, some organizations have a higher average than others. So a good example would be FANG. That's Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, and probably Twitter. All of those are probably 200,000, you know, 180,000 with stocks. Um, those jobs typically for a cybersecurity person with experience or skills, easy, the six figures easy. Now, if you're talking about, somebody said, do you think Microsoft certifications are worth it? Yeah, so Microsoft certifications are a good example. So perfect, there's professional level certifications in Microsoft that also lend themselves to six figures. So uh, that is six figures. Those are things that can get you six figures. There's also certain skills that can get you six figures. Six figure skills. And help me out, guys. If you guys have things that you know of, one would be uh, if you happen to be good at um, SIEM technology. That's a security information um, event managers, specific, specifically uh, Splunk, that's a six-figure skill, especially if you have like a year in on that one. If you happen to be a programmer with certain code, certain types of programming lend itself to six because there's not a lot of people doing it, especially if you happen to be good at it, that's six figures. If you happen to be uh, really good at pen testing, 
um, OSC, um, OCP, OSCP, as a, that's a six-figure certification. So many different things um, that can get you, skill sets can get you six figures. So I hope I hope that that helps you out. Like if that's what you're what you're aiming for, and it really should be all of our aim. But those are some things that can get you in that door of six figures. Six figures is not really a big deal, to be honest with you. Um, so let me see. What is your role and what is my LinkedIn? So I was sharing my LinkedIn earlier. So if you go to LinkedIn and type in Bruce space CISSP space RMF, you should find me. And my role right now is uh, I work for a government agency as an information system security officer doing information system security officer type shit. <laughs> and it sucks. I hate it. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, let me see. M- MV says on tick on YouTube says, um, what is the roadmap for learning programming to help help you in cybersecurity? Um, so there's a couple of 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 software that you can learn i mean software certain programming languages you can learn that's going to help you in 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 cybersecurity you don't have to i don't i'm not a programmer i don't know you know i know like html you know like a little bit and i still have to google it you know what i mean um cascading style sheets you know but um things that that are helpful is uh there's one called regx regex is really good to it's not even a language it's more like a scripting language there's a bunch of scripting languages that help you out here let me show you my screen here so regex is a good one to learn because and the reason why i say it's 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 good to learn is because a lot of um the tools that we use use regex like splunk uses regex um different seams use regex you can use it on like um on on routers and you can use it on a lot of security devices So regex is not even a software. Another one would be Python. Python super super uh, helpful. Um, I have not had to use it, but there's been times when it would have been very useful for me to know because it'll it just makes my job easier. So scripting really these are helpful things, helpful tools to know. Another one would be PHP is a good one. Perl Perl is another good one for for our for our field, that one's come in handy a couple times. Um, another one is uh, man, what, what's another? What's another one? Um, help me out here, guys. If you guys know any other languages that are good to know, do you have to know them? No, you you don't. You don't have to know them. It's not a prerequisite or anything, but they're good to know. It's going to help you out a little bit, and um, and it, you know, it's helpful, but not not necessary. <clears throat> Let me see. And you said, Michael said, um, I have level three certs. My question is becoming more a cloud expert doing um, doing GRC. It will guarantee to be a remote worker. Nothing's going to guarantee you become a work, remote worker. Um, nothing guarantees you to become a remote worker. The the best thing you can do is 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 help your skill set is is get you closer to is increase your probability okay there's no like increase your probability by let me show you what i mean so here's here's how how i've increased my own probability to getting a job a remote work job let me show you a couple things and i talk about this in a book i wrote but let me just let me just show you exactly how i'm able to do it right now live if you're interested in this anybody else follow along with me here's my book i wrote about how to get in this field what exact all the stuff i'm telling you about here i break it all down to you it's on amazon it's called cyber jobs Cybersecurity jobs resume marketing one for working from home one that breaks down all the paths i'm not a hacker you know i have not been a hacker i do not know programming but I'm making I'm making six figures. I'm doing really good. I don't work remotely. But let me show you. So if you go to LinkedIn, here's my LinkedIn. Somebody asked me, what's my LinkedIn? Here it is right, right here, Bruce Brown. And um, if you want to know, it's uh, Bruce uh, space CISSP space RMF. That's where I'm at. 
Um, so here's here's what I do. So in my profile, first of all, fill out your profile completely. You don't have to do all this extra stuff of me posting things or all that kind of stuff. Just put all everything that you've done, put it on here. Number one. All right. The next thing you want to do is for a remote position is do this. Watch this. Um, go to about. Where's about at? Where's about? Here it is. So in about, if you go to more, look what I did here. These words right here. Looking for remote work, doing risk management framework. And I know that sounds very simple, but this has worked for me. And you do that on every platform. If you want to work remotely, ask for it. And apply for it. Apply for those jobs and ask for it. And a lot of times people will contact me and say and tell me, hey, hey, Bruce, this is a this is a remote position, by the way. They'll start off their sentence saying that. And it's because I ask. I ask for it and I'm applying for these jobs all the time. That's how you do it. So um, is it going to help? Is it going to help you to put GRC on there and be a cloud expert? Yeah, sure. But do more than just that. You know, do more than just you got to put it on your resume, apply for remote jobs. Now, remote jobs are a lot harder to get. They're more competitive. So anything you can do to help you to get into that position is going to is better. You know, is do it. Added you on LinkedIn. Yeah, I saw you, man. I'll, I'll uh, I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Um, let me see. Before I answer more of those questions, let me see. Somebody says, um, "I'm doing CYSA plus certification. You think I can get?" a good paying job when it's finished. I think I already answered this question, but the answer is how much experience do you have? They really go by experience. Experience is ex when you're talking about money, it's not certifications. It goes experience, degree, if you have one, and then certification. Not really. Okay. Not really meaning, meaning a month. How many, how many months of experience do you have? And I can answer this question. I live in New York. Okay, how many months of experience do you have doing any kind of IT whatsoever? I'm, I'm going to answer this question. Indeed.com. I'm in help desk. Okay, that's good. Six months. All right, that's a good start. Oh, in 2015. I did access management. Okay, well, I mean, put it on your resume. Um, that was a long time ago, but um, it's it's gonna be, you know, it it you, it's not gonna more than likely won't be a lot of money. And I know New York is not cheap, so just the certification alone is not gonna necessarily get you the kind of money that you're looking for. That being said, it's not impossible. Okay, I don't wanna I don't wanna blow smoke or lie to you, but um. It's probably not going to be the kind of money you want. I've been jumping around ever since then. Yeah, but how if you've done cybersecurity, if you've done any kind of IT, in not cybersecurity, any kind of IT, information technology, you want to put it on your resume. So put that six months on your resume, the, the skills that you earned, put those on your resume. Um, I'm trying to get back into IT again. Yeah, so everything I'm telling you what to do, that's just what you got to do, man. <laughs> I don't know why people don't listen to me. It's kind of crazy. I don't understand. Like if you, you're telling me you want to do this and people constantly contact, contact me saying, hey, Bruce, I want to. And then the person, the people who do, they'll, they come back and say, yo, I got a job, bro. Yo, I got a job. Yo, what should I do? What should I do? They're like, then their next challenge is, hey, I got this interview. In, in a week, like, can you give me some pointers on what to say, what to do? All you guys got to do is listen to me, man. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I'm just, I'm just telling you. It works, man. Everything I'm telling you to do, it freaking works. Bruce, what's your thoughts on people having uh, working multiple jobs at once? This is a good question. Actually, somebody else asked, asked me this question on YouTube. And um, 
I've done it before. I would say it sucks. Don't do it. That would be my first piece of advice. Don't do it. I mean, if you have to, you got to do what you got to do to feed your family. But um, it's rough, man. I talk about this in one of my books. But if you're going to do it, here's how you do it. If you're going to be what's called, it's called uh, overworked. That's not the word for it. What's the word for it? It's called um, overworked, overemployed, overemployed. Yeah, overemployed. So if you want to do it, here's how you do it. You take one full time job. And you take one part time job, both remote, 100 percent remote. And they have a site, I think it's called uh, overemployed.com or something like that. Go to Google, type in overemployed. You can find these. You can find recommendations on which jobs to do. But one, one job full time, one job part time, both 100% remote. The other part time job, you tell them, I have a full time job, right? Tell this beef upfront with them and tell them, I have a full time job just to let you know I might not be able to do all the meetings. But if are you okay with that? And if they say cool, then just tell them your like tell them your schedule. Here's my schedule at work, my full time job. Here's what I'm gonna do. And then another thing is just like um, Jerry just said. He said you got to make sure that there's their policy doesn't conflict. So if you have a job where they say if they're telling you you cannot work for another company, especially com a competitor, you never want to do that anyway. But if they're telling you in there that you work eight hours for us, period. I wouldn't I wouldn't violate it. But right? if they're blatantly telling you that and you need this full time job and you're afraid of losing it, do not do not do this with that full time job. Do not do it. Um, but if you work that full time job and they're like, whatever, just do what we need you to do and go to the meetings or whatever. And we're cool. And you have another you know, part time job on the side. They don't have to know anything about that. You do you do your thing. You can't. OK, there's a few things. Um, don't go working for competitors in the same industry. That's just stupid. I mean, don't do it. It's illegal. Um, don't do it. <laughs> don't do anything that's a conflict of interest. Um, that'd be like if you work in, you can't work for two different governments. Like that is just incredibly stupid. I mean, I just don't do it. I mean, you can go to jail for some of this stuff. Um, so th those would be the things I would say, like, don't don't break, don't violate the company's laws, like especially if you need that job, that job. And they've been gracious enough to accept you in and they're paying you pretty good. Like, don't don't. Why would you why would you risk what you have working this part time job just to make a few extra dollars? Don't do that. Right. And num and, and the third thing is, I, I would say, just don't like it's not a good idea. Just get a good job. Get one good job and stick with that one. And then if you want to do some side stuff, do a business. Like do something totally different. But that's just that's just me, my two cents. But if you're going to do it, do do one that's a full time, one that's a part time. Tell your part time that you work the full time and then tell them, make sure they know your schedule. I've done that and that shit worked. Uh, what do you think about starting in IT cybersecurity services? What do I think about starting a cybersecurity IT services company. Um, I actually tried it once. I put out like a got a Duns number and I put it on Sam's.gov and all that kind of stuff. Um, I actually got a couple of callbacks and I did a couple of like one on ones with the people who aren't. But it just didn't go anywhere for me personally. That's not to say I won't try it again one day. Maybe um, you can do it. I know a couple people who have done it. And um, it's I know. Yeah, I know a couple people who've done it. And had various degrees of success. So, you know, um, it can work. It can work. I've tried it before. I have a Dunn's number. Um, I have a great book idea. Maybe we can collaborate. Hit me up on LinkedIn, man. Hit me up on LinkedIn. I got, if you, for those of you who are aspirational, people who have businesses, people who have content, if you have a site, if you have you already do this kind of stuff on the side. If you already are a professional, if you have any ideas, if you have any kind of YouTube videos you want to do, if you want me to interview you, you want me to put you on, whatever the case may be, um, we there's a chance we can collaborate, and I can put your I can either put your content on here, 
um, and send traffic your way. You can do courses. I will put them on my site and we'll collaborate books, whatever you want to do. Like I'm open to that kind of stuff. I don't have a lot of time right now, but there's a way we can collaborate to where I'm just helping you with my traffic. I got tons of traffic. People are always coming to me and I'll be I'd be more than happy to send you some traffic and we can figure out some kind of side deal. You know, so if you're interested in that, I haven't had anybody take me up on the offer and be serious about it. But it's it, the my the offer stands. Uh, let me see. YouTube to me. YouTube is saying. Uh, um, I bought your ISSO and remote courses. Um, hit me up, Michael. If you have any questions whatsoever, man, I got your back. I can I can help you with any kind of direct questions you have um, on email, any kind of personal information, uh, personal questions that you have about your job or business or walk you through anything you need. Thank you for purchasing, by the way. Appreciate it. Um, have you ever worked two remote jobs at once? And if so, is it worth it? Yeah, I just answered this one. But the answer is yes. And was it worth it? Once it was, once it wasn't. I did it twice. The first time I did it, it was it was a nightmare. <laughs> it was a nightmare. It was, I did two full-time jobs, which is absolutely stupid and should never do that. Um, then I did the right way is to have one full-time and one part-time and then tell the part-time what you're doing. And then that way, if you have to work on weekends for the part-time job, then you can do it. Um, somebody asked me, thank you, Bruce. One last question. I'm an ISO. Uh, what do you suggest for emotional intelligence learning? Bring everyone together to do the work. Um, so emotional intelligence, just to educate everybody. One of the things that I talk about um, is emotional intelligence is necessary for cybersecurity work. And the reason why is because a lot of times you're dealing with people's emotions and feelings when there's a data breach or you 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 have to be the bearer of bad news and tell them, hey, we got to spend another six months applying some patches and, and the, the organization wants it done tomorrow or something, right? So emotional intelligence mean having the empathy to see things from the other person's perspective. That's, that's the gist of it. And um, empathizing with them and seeing it from their perspective. They're, they're an overworked IT person that's already applied a thousand patches. And now you're telling them there's a thousand more that need to be applied. It's, of course, they're going to be upset about it. If you see things from their perspective, then you can take you can be patient with them. If, if they're short with you or they're upset, they're pissed off. You can just tell them, hey, man, I'm with you. Like, this is what I do. I'm just like, yeah, I'm with you. Like, I, how can we do this better? You want me to go tell them like what like what's going on? Then I'll be an intermediate and, and say, hey, listen, we've already applied a thousand. Like if you see it from their perspective, then the answers are clear. But you don't what you don't want to do with with what I've noticed with some cybersecurity people that don't have any kind of emotional intelligence is that they're kind of like playing the cops. They're like they bust down doors and they're, they're holding their gun in people's face saying, Hey, freeze, you know, <laughs> you have to do this no matter what period. Right. That's not the attitude you want to have. Like you want to have an attitude of I'm with you. We're a team. I'm telling, I'm, I'm not the one making up these rules. The organization is making up the rules. How can we get this done? Is there a way we can do this? Do you want me to bring the manager in here and get and tell them our grievances? Our, we, we're a team. We have to do this together. So, yeah, so that's this, this is the approach that you need to take. And if you take that approach of being empathetic and, and treating it as like we're a team and we need to do this together, then you can get things done a lot easier with less stress because it's not on you. The one of the mistakes I made when I first got in this field is try to take on all the burdens. Cause as a cop, I would try to, you, a lot of cops, they don't, they also lack emotional intelligence and that's what's happening. A lot of times they don't know that these people, some of them should not be police officers cause they don't have the patience. They don't have the emotional intelligence. They don't have the maturity to be given any kind of authority, let alone have getting a badge and a gun. And they're giving them to them. And then these guys are freaking out like something happens and they're overworked and overstressed. And then they're shooting people in the back who are running away. Like, what is wrong with you? You know, <laughs> they don't have emotional intelligence. They don't they don't have maturity. They don't they're not taking the time to think and get beyond their adrenaline. Because I've been in meetings where I'm getting yelled at, you know, and, and they're the customer or client is freaking out. And I'm just quiet. 
and listen to them. I don't get my feelings. Do I? Am I upset? Yeah, you know, I don't want to be yelled at. I don't want to be treated in any kind of way. But I have to think to myself, okay, what's going on here? Like, let me separate the emotion from what's actually happening. This person's upset because something's late. Got it. Why is it late? Now I'm dealing with the reasons why it's late. And, you know, sometimes it's my fault. I'm like, I apologize for that. Do you want me to contact? I can bring my manager in here. Let's talk to him. Let's figure it out, you know? But for me to be up in my feelings, it does not going to help me to panic. It's not going to help her, this person to panic. It's we need to come together and figure out how to fix this. That's it, you know? So that's that's my approach to having emotional intelligence in cybersecurity. It does get stressful from time to time. So I appreciate you bringing that up, Michael. I appreciate that. That's a good question. But how do you learn emotional intelligence? Man, it's kind of a maturity thing, you know? There's some books about emotional intelligence by some premier psychologists and stuff that are out there, but it's something you got to like do. You know, it's it's a, it's like a muscle, like learning patience, learning um, to persevere when things are tough. It's it's really like a muscle, like it's something you it's like doing workouts, doing sprints. Like it, it just takes time to build up the the emotional maturity and the calluses that it takes to deal with like difficult people or whatever. And to be patient and realize one of the things I realize is that panicking doesn't help. Even if you're about to you're on the road and somebody swerves in your lane, if you panic, sometimes it'll you overcompensate and you'll flip the car. But if you're cool and calm, you just get over real quick, move over. And you're looking at the other side, you know, you can calmly make those decisions. When other people are panicking, overcompensating and flipping their car, you're just like calm. You're just like, okay, move over. You're not flipping the guy off and going crazy. You're like, okay, they made a mistake. They didn't see me. I was in their blind spot or whatever. They had a bad day and they're trying to run me off the road or whatever. Like going about your business. I'm trying to live. You know, I got I got 30 more years to live. Like, do you? You want to go die on the road? That's up to you, bro. You know, <laughs> I got a family to feed. So. Uh, let me see. Thank you for that super sticker, M7. I appreciate you. It says, are you live on another platform at the same time? Yeah, I'm on TikTok. That's why I'm looking over here. And then I'm also on um, YouTube. I mean, Facebook and Twitter. I mean, fa yeah, Facebook and Twitter. Um, were you a cop? Yeah, I was a, I was a police officer in the Air Force for about five years. That's a real tough job. That's why... I, I don't think just anybody can be a cop and I, I really empathize with their with their with some of the stuff they have to go through. Um, but I also know when they make mistakes, like some of these videos, I'm like, wow, these guys are idiots, man. Like they, they're not idiots. They, they shouldn't be cops at all. Like some people should not be cops, man. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, some of the decisions they're making, I was not taught to do those things. Um, let me see. Can I please? Can you talk? Can you talk a little bit about how to get risk management in cybersecurity? How to get risk management in cybersecurity. So they have entire um, programs to do risk in cybersecurity. And so these are typically put under the umbrella as GRC, Governance, Risk, and Compliance. And that's a huge field. It's a huge field. Compliance is is making sure that organizations are in line with the government or industry, you know, whether it be the retail industry or banking industry. There's certain things that you have to do as a bank to make sure that you're protecting people's data um, and money. And then there's governance, which is making sure that we're in line with laws, different laws in the organization. Like we might have policies that we have to have in place. And then there's risk. And risk is dealing with exactly what you're talking about. And risk usually has some sort of a risk management process. And that's really my expertise is risk management. Because we're not going to eliminate all security issues in the organization, whether they be physical or operational or technical. So the best we can do as an organization is manage the risk. Managing the risk means doing what we can to improve the security that we have what we can to document the things we can't fix so that we know what's going on. All of those, those are things 
a couple of things that we can do to manage the risk. Another thing we can do is if we can't actually fix that particular system, maybe there's something we can do to mitigate the risk that's involved with that vulnerability we could patch. So we have a web server and it has this certain uh, IIS 7 uh, hole on it, or the, the issue is that it is on IIS, but we can't fix it because we've got some proprietary software that has to run with IIS. Maybe there's a firewall fix. Maybe there's a proxy we can put, a reverse proxy we can, or something we can do to make it so that that vulnerability that we know has a certain threat, we can fix it in a way that we couldn't patch it, we couldn't replace it, but we could put something in, in front of it to where we've kind of, we didn't put a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. What we did was we we removed the risk in another way. So risk management is all, there's several different systems that cover risk management. One is the international standard ISO 27001. There's one that's the one that the U.S. uses, uh, government, uh, state and federal governments use risk management framework, and they use something called NIST cybersecurity uh, framework. And then you've got uh, PCI compliance, which is also managing risk by implementing best security practices. You've got HIPAA, which is protecting healthcare information and, and managing the compliance and the risk associated with having patients' data. So all of those are methods of risk management. Um, within different organizations. Hope that answers your question. How can I pivot out of SOC analyst role? Why would you want to get out of SOC analyst role? Can you tell me? I'm 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 listening. What? Why? Why do you want to get out of SOC analyst role? Better is name. I'm I'm talking to somebody on TikTok, by the way. So they said. They want to know, and you guys too on YouTube, like, what do you guys think? I don't like 24-hour shift life. <laughs> I'm laughing because I didn't like it either, brother. <laughs> I did that shit for about a year and a half, man. <laughs> um, that's That's not a fun part of it. <laughs> Oh, man. And then sometimes I'd be in a skiff like that to a place with no windows, man. They, they put us in this box with no windows and all you have is a screen. It's like Neo in the Matrix and all this code is flashing. I mean, it's it's there's good parts of it. I mean, like it was pretty technical. So we had to like analyze information as it's coming through. And that's I, that was kind of fun. It's like a puzzle. But uh, yeah, I didn't like being the 24 hour shifts is what kind of got to me <laughs> after a while psychologically it's like this is ridiculous never ending um so how can you get out of it um so there's a couple things like one of the things about the sock role if you pay attention to it is that they're teaching you a lot of different skills that that are needed throughout the organization um and you want to you want to exploit those skills as much as possible you exploit when you have exploit is use use those skills as much as possible by putting them on your resume so what do i mean by that so specifically for security uh for security analyst roles which is what you are cybersecurity analyst um there's certain things that you need to know that a help desk person won't know for example you'll you'll have to know a little bit about network security stuff so you definitely want to put that stuff on your resume um, you have to know about packets. You know, you have to know how to analyze packets. Like you probably have packet analyzers and you probably have some, all the tools that you use, right? So you want to put all that stuff on your resume. I'm telling you, one of the best places to be in, positions to be in for a cybersecurity person is what you're doing. Because you have so many ways to pivot. Like you can go many different ways because Whereas help desk is really cool because it gives you a real solid foundation, but you are actually at a, a level that's a little bit above because you're specialized. So now with your special skill, you need to use all those tools and you put all stuff on your resume. So when I was a cybersecurity analyst, I had I knew ArcSight, which is a seam. I knew that that's a security implement uh, information in uh, a security information. Uh, event manager. Okay. It's just a place where it takes all the logs. I had to know how logs, audit logs worked. What I had to know individual audit log settings. I had to know individual audit log events.
from Windows and from Linux and from other platforms. You have to know a little bit about what's going on with the firewall because the firewall rules will affect how much data is coming in and out. You need to put all that stuff in your resume. He said, that's what my lead says, but I'm I'm over it, man. I'm telling he's right. I'm, I'm actively trying to make a move by the end of this year. And you can do that. That's a great plan. So listen, though, what I'm trying to tell you is use the skills like right now. Go all in on on this stuff. I know you hate it, but this is the hate. This is this is the pain you need to go to another level. This this pain that you're suffering right now, if you can get through this and you can learn as much as possible and get a certification or two on the way. You don't have to worry about this no more. And I'm telling I'm going to tell you right now how, how I did it. I was I was in that role for a while. And um, actually, it was a great learning experience because I learned scene technology, all the experience that you all the tools. You got to put that on your resume. Somebody said help desk is saturated. Exactly. A lot of people know that. And this is that's the basics that you need to know. That's the ground floor. You're up here. You've, you've ascended to another level. Now it's time to take the next step. And that's what you can do right now. So by being a security analyst is one of the best ways to pivot, pivot because you know, you're going to have access to tools that most help desk people and most GRC people like myself do not have. So you're going to learn. Uh, you should be able to have exposure to network scanners uh, from Nessus to uh uh, to Qualys, to what name your pick, pick something like you have ex exposure to that. Put that on your resume. Uh, you have exposure to um, to seam technology. You're doing all the best, a lot of the best practices and stuff that you have to actually know how packets work. But the only thing is you got to put that on your resume. You got to put it on your resume. Now, whenever they reach out to you and say, hey, man, could you help us do this policy? Could you help us do the procedure? Could you write a procedure so that you can help the other SOC analysts on this? You you should say yes, because that's something you can put on your resume. And that's GRC stuff. GRC stuff, man, let me tell you something. The difference between a GRC person, a policy person like myself, and a SOC analyst is I'm not working I'm not working shift work. I work from home. I work from home. I'm not doing shift work. Um because I'm not, you know, I don't have to stare at a screen in the box. So my job's different. I, pro I probably get paid as much as an analyst, probably more, to be honest with you. Um, and I'm not, this is not bragging, man. I'm just telling you, do the work. Do that heavy lifting that you need to do so that when you're ready, success favors the prepared. That pain is what you need to prepare. It's like lifting weights. You go to the gym and you got to break down that muscle to build it up again. That's what you're doing. Your knowledge is about to go to another. Your knowledge is going to another level. And I know you're over it, but you just if you could just survive this pain a little bit longer, you're going to be able to go to another level. And the way that you do it is the stuff I'm telling you, which is to put this stuff on your resume, put it on your resume. all the tools, all the I have a free downloadable resume. If you haven't heard me say it 15 times already on this live, go download my resume. It'll give you an idea of how to word the stuff you want to put on your resume. It'll give you an idea of how what kinds of things they're looking for for my industry, which is GRC. They're looking for writers. They're looking for people who can write a policy. People could write a procedure. People can write. That's the kind of stuff that they're looking for in my industry. Uh, but you might not want to do that. You might want to do forensics. They're looking for something totally different. You can find that stuff by going to if you go to LinkedIn, you go to LinkedIn. And then you type in if you want to see data, data forensics, you would type that in and you would look for all of the different um, um, keywords that they're using and you put that on your resume. But as a security analyst, as a SOC analyst, you have exposure to a lot of the stuff that they're looking for. So that's how you do it. Just give, put that stuff on your resume and then with, don't stop there. The next thing you want to do is post that on LinkedIn, on Dice, on Monster, and on, I would say, make that your job to post all your skills and put it out there and you will find something better, something else. Okay, John says, thank you for that 10 bucks, John. I appreciate that. He says, um, what piece of literature could you recommend to show leadership other than the obvious? Uh, why is RMF mandated in government agencies? Okay, this is, seems like two different questions I can answer. What piece of literature, literature would you recommend to show leadership? 
other than the obvious. Um, for leadership books, leadership books. Um, um, I'm recently reading one called uh, Man, it's really, really good, man. Um, there's one called There's one by David Goggins. Uh, this book is really, man, it's really, really good. And I don't know how much of a leadership leadership book, but the stuff he's saying has some of the things a leader should have. Some of the some of the strength a leader should have. And um, I really like the book. I'm almost done with it. It's right now like this this year so far. It's my favorite book. It's called You Can't Hurt Me. And I'm trying to let me see if I can bring it up. So this is this is not an obvious book. I've, I've not heard anybody recommend this one, but this dude, this dude was a Navy SEAL. And uh, he's he's just a psychopath, man. He's he's online. <laughs> this dude is he's out of his mind. Hardcore. And his name is David Goggins. There he is right there. Um, and he was a Navy SEAL that went through buds like four times or something crazy. He He's an ultra marathon runner. And um, master your mind to defy the odds. And in my mind, a great leader has strength. You know, a great leader is somebody who who will work harder than the rest of the workers. And so that this is one book that I would recommend. Another one that I'm going to read is called Extreme Ownership. And it's kind of the same kind of attitude. It's another Navy SEAL. I, I don't remember the guy's name, but um, really good dude. I like every time I see his his talks, I, I'm, there's a lot of what he says is that that I'm, I'm connecting with, but extreme ownership is owning the problem. Like don't, you can't, you can't just keep putting off. You can't say everybody else is the problem. Like you have to own the problem. And that's what David Goggins is saying too. You have to own it. Like if you, if listen, if you, if, if everything else is, if the world is the thing that made you these problems, how can you fix it? If it if it because I'm in this situation is because of what some other man has done to me. How can I ever change that? How can I change my situation? I can't. Because they put me here. But if I say this is my problem and I'm here because of me and what can I do to get stronger, to get out of this situation? Then I have owned the problem. How can I fix a problem that I don't own? So if you own the problem, just like David Goggins learned to do in this book, this book is it's this is one of the most powerful books I've ever read. I mean, I'm emotional about this book, but what he's saying is like if you own the problem, if you own in your mind the problems that are happening to you, no matter what is going on. You can you you can go over you can overcome any boundary, anything. Because you own the problem. And that battle inside is what we have to overcome. So that that would be a book that I would recommend for any leader. The other, Extreme Ownership and uh, David Goggins, You Can't Hurt Me. And he has got a new book out, but I haven't read, started reading that one yet. And then your other question was, why is RMF mandated in the government agencies? Um, So they used to be... I've been in this for a long time. So the they used to have something called uh DITSCAP and DIACAP. DITSCAP was called uh DOD Information Technology Accre Certification and Accreditation Program. And it's essentially doing the same kind of thing. And um it's essentially doing the same thing where it's managing the risk. So the reason why you have RMF is because it's risk management framework and it's it's a way to limit the amount of risk. There's no way to eliminate all 100% of any risk. So the idea behind it is to limit the level of risk that you have um, and manage the exposure that you have to threats. You can't control outside threats. Like if there's an earthquake, 
You can't control if there's an earthquake. If there's a if there's an insider threat and somebody's trying to sabotage your company, what can you do? Right. Any anybody at any time can do whatever the hell they want. But the best thing you can do is say, OK, if this system goes down, I have a down. It's down. It's backed up. Our main stuff is backed up at another site. We can just go there. That's managing the risk. Another thing you can do if you have an earthquake, we know that this is an earthquake zone. We're on the fault line. We're in L.A. We have another site in Oklahoma. And so if this site goes down for whatever reason, because the power went out, we can just go over. You can't control threats, right? Threats are going to do what they're going to do, but you can control your response to the threats. And so that's why government agencies have risk management framework. When they don't, that's when you get catastrophic disasters. When you, A good example of that is, I don't know if you heard of the Colonial Pipeline. So Colonial Pipeline is a it's a gas pipeline that goes from one state to another and some hackers took out their network which affected their the pipeline went down and so that affected like a whole eastern seaboard or something like the gas was out for like i don't know if it's hours or days but that's a catastrophic failure and they did not have risk management framework put in place well, Lynette, they didn't have anything to produce. Obviously, something was wrong, right? So, I mean, otherwise, if the site went down, they'd have another one come up. Or if the site went down, they'd say, okay, what's our fail safe to get this site back up again? They got taken out by a hacker. That's why you have risk management frame, framework. I know, like, it's it's so trendy to focus on hacking or whatever, you know, but that's that's a 1% of all of cybersecurity. It's, it's a tiny percentage. The rest of it is the people sitting at the keyboards. Do they know what they're supposed to do? If they click on one damn link and that system is not secure that they're on, that could take out the whole network. So you have people educated on what to click on and what not to. You got to block those malicious links and malicious uh, packets coming in or malicious uh, attachments coming in. And you need to have your system that you're on, the actual workstation or laptop or whatever, secure. It has to be secure. So even if a malware does uh, get downloaded, it won't be able to do anything because there's no weaknesses for it to exploit or there's less weaknesses for it to exploit. So if you have that, it's kind of like defense in depth, right? It's like you have not only do you have a antivirus software on the system, but also the system's updated with all the current patches. and We've got everybody educated, so they're not going to click on links. Risk management framework protects all those things. It it hits all of those things. Um, somebody said, "I heard cybersecurity is is boring." Um, it's it can be boring, but it makes money. If you like making money, then I would highly recommend doing this. But if you if you don't want to be bored, I can't help you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm here to make you make money. Like I can't help you with with uh, whether or not you you are uh, entertained. But if you want to make money, if you're kind of trying to you're trying to go to the next level, then that's something I can help you with. All right, let me see if I have any more questions. Somebody said Goggins is the mother effing man. Yes, yes, he is. That book is incredible. Um, he says the audio book can't hurt me is amazing. That audio book is crazy because he's actually reading stuff that's outside. He's it's like a podcast. It's like some of it's in the like out, not even in the book. And he's actually talking on it. It's really good. It's well done. It's it's very powerful. This dude's life is very powerful. It's. It's life changing. Like I'm re I'm listening to it. and I'm like, damn, this is. Stuff that I can apply in my own life. I'm talking about leadership in the office, decision makers. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about too. Um, um, you you're talking about like a formal book that everybody can, I don't know, um, where's my cheese or something? I don't know. Like <laughs> if they're talking about that, like where's my cheese? Like, isn't that one? Where's my cheese? I you know, I guess you could probably do this one. Who moved my cheese? That's what that's what it's called. I'm being serious, by the way. <laughs> uh, what's this one? This is the one that all the all the eggheads talk about. 
Let me show you this one. Here's one. Yeah, check this one out. Who moved my cheese? There you go. There's one for you. Okay, let me see. Um, see if I can answer any more questions. Ever known anyone to cross over into aerospace sector of GRC in the civilian world? Seems harder to find domains, um, domain info on that versus the NIST 853. Um, so I've I've actually worked, I've actually worked in um in the aerospace sector doing GRC, um, in the civilian world, and um, they use a lot. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's because the the jobs that I worked. They were using a lot of the stuff from the Department of Defense. They would use some of the Stig stuff. They would use um, a lot of 853. Um, a bigger push would be when I went from. I noticed there's a big gap between the private sector in like I was working in Verizon and then the government. Very very different. Um, that being said, they they still use some of the stuff from the Department of Defense and the NIST 853. But what is, let me see if I answer your question. Every, ever know anyone who cross-trained from aerospace sector of GRC in the civilian world? Okay, pure, you're talking about purely civilian with no connection to NASA or anything. Um, seems harder to go. Um, purely civilian sector into government work. Government type NIST 853. I'm trying to think of anybody I know who did that. And now that I think about it, it's pretty rare, but I do I do know a couple of people who did it. I was when I was working at NASA, we NASA's mostly government. Um it's considered it's aerospace, but it's mostly government type work. So we they used the NIST 853. But I knew a few people who came from the purely private sector into where we were working. And um, there were different like programmers and different kinds of. So, yeah, I've known people to do it. Um, normally, they were very technical. They weren't like GRC people per se. So ha do I know anybody who's done it? Yes. Um, but, um, yeah, so it, it's not it's not a big leap. Like what they're really looking for is best security practices. And um, if you know an equivalent um, sometimes if you know an equivalent framework, it can be helpful for the NIST. Like if you knew CIS controls, because actually the government does use the CIS benchmark and some of their controls from time to time. So it's not a completely huge stretch. And sometimes they, they need that, that new blood, especially like younger people, like a, young, a lot of the young people, excluding boomers and, and Gen X, myself included, they need that fresh blood from other industries to come in and it's very, very helpful. So, and I've noticed like when we have a new person come in, they have like different ideas of how to implement things. It's actually very helpful. So, you know, yeah, it's, it can happen. Uh, no. Okay. Sorry, man. <laughs> I didn't understand the NIST publications for, for leadership books. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any NIST 800 or NIST, period that are talking about leadership um they're mostly like engineering type books let me see i'm talking about leadership in the office mm. Probably, let me see there might be one i think they have one on information management Inf information inform information system management um, missed 800, 800. I want to say I've seen one before. This is saying NIST 837, but that's risk management framework. Um, oh yeah, I don't, I gotta say no. I gotta say no. I'm not sure. There's one called NIST 800. 39, which is information 
is managing information risk, but I don't. That's not really leadership. So I, I got to say no, man. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm. I'm. I don't know that they. That I'm not sure whether that where that book is. All right, I'm going to answer a few more questions and then I'm out of here. With the massive layoffs that happened um, in tech recently, is GRC harder to get into? Um, great question. But the industries that I'm in, I have to say, um, it's a little bit slower, but I wouldn't say it was necessarily more difficult because GRC and the government is not directly affected by by what's happening in the stock mark market. So those, you're talking about like FANG. You're talking about like uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and I don't know, add a couple more in there, Google, Alphabet. So that makes the news because the, you know, it's affected directly by their, their bottom line, which is the stock market. That's how, you know, most of their money is, most of their War chest, a lot of their war chest is in the stock market. So the government jobs that I'm talking about that I work in are not directly affected by that. I mean, it does have some impact. You know, they they might hire less people like the company who has stocks, who has a contract with the government might hire less people. Excuse me. But ultimately, we need a lot of people to do this work. So it's slowed down a bit, but it hasn't stopped like what's happening. I haven't seen like massive layoffs happening in government type jobs, any jobs that are working for the government, I haven't seen massive layoffs. The massive layoffs happen when the president says, we're going to cut funding to this organization or that organization. And then that's when you see the layoffs in my field. So that is when you see some crazy layoffs. <laughs> but uh, no, this field's still going, it's still pretty strong. It's slowed down a bit, I have to admit, but it's still it's tons of jobs out there. I'm still every day getting all kinds of offers that I, that's too many for me. So if you're on my newsletter, I actually send these out like weekly. I'll just compile them and then I send them out to people who who are following me on my newsletter. Uh, let me see here. Advice uh, for someone who is coming straight out of high school trying to get into cybersecurity. So it is really ne is it really necessary to go to college? Um so what what is necessary is the is the experience. And then the, your next natural question should be, well, how do I get experience, Bruce? Like what how do I how do I get experience? <laughs> um so what great thing about college is that it gives you a little bit more opportunities. Like it gives you opportunities to get into Hell, you could work on the campus and have a job and be teaching, I mean, and be learning as you're going. And you can also get into internships easier and apprenticeships easier. And it just opens up a lot more doors. That being said, so I would recommend college. Like I know people crapping all over it because the universities keep charging more and more. But not everybody has those kind of opportunities. Not everybody has those kind of resources or time. So the answer to the question, no, you don't have to go into college to get into IT. Because that's what your real question is information technology, not necessarily cybersecurity. Because cyber, IT is the foundation on which cybersecurity sits. So let's broaden the horizon and talk about information technology. No, you don't have to go to college for it. But what you do have to have is the knowledge. You, you don't necessarily have to have experience to start. You don't have to have a college degree or a certification to start. But one thing that you have to have is knowledge. So what I would do if I was in college and I really wanted to get into information technology or cybersecurity in particular is I would start to learn the knowledge and that that's all that stuff's on the, you can get, start off with just free stuff on YouTube, go on YouTube and start listening to guys like me actually teach the stuff, not on TikTok. Like, I don't know how much you can learn on a, on a 15 second video, to be honest with you, like, or a 10 minute video, whatever. Right. You probably need to go to YouTube or any platform that has long form content where they're teaching you for free basics. The first thing you need to know is whether or not you want to do this, because this is not for everybody. No, not everybody has the patience for this. You know, not everybody has the has the maturity, to be honest with you, for what we do to learn. Like it really takes like people think, oh, you got to be a genius. 
or you got to know math or logic or what. No, what it really takes is patience. That's what it really takes. I'm just being honest with you. You know, it, has, it takes a certain amount of, of intelligence and in, in knowledge, of course. But the patience is what you really need because as a high schooler, like you're going to be distracted to go hang out with your friends at the bowling alley or wherever you guys do these days or play video games 24 hours a day or watch three hours of stretch of TikTok or whatever you're going to do. But you got to be able to sit down, have the patience and maturity to watch a video about how to secure a computer, how do computers work? How do how does the RAM work with the storage, work with the motherboard, work with the G CPU? How does it actually work? You got to have the patience to sit down and watch that. If you can do that, go to YouTube, watch a few of those videos, and you're like, this is interesting. I like this. Then what you can do is if you're really serious, is, is buy a book. Buy a book on um, – there's a couple things you can do. What I would recommend straight out the box is to do like a, a CompTIA A plus certification because it has all the common body of knowledge that you need to know to get an information technology job. Once you go through that A plus certification, take the certification if you can afford it. If not, um, you can actually put on a resume that you're going for the A plus certification. So when I say resume, okay. Um, you want to do, you want to put your, if you want an example of a resume, you can use my resume, go to, go to my, um, profile. You can download a free copy of my resume. You can see how it's worded and the style of it is very important. It's called ATS style resume. Very simple, straightforward. Now you, you might, you're going to look at it and be like, like 20 years of experience. Like what the hell? But what I want you to pay attention to is the format. Like what is, how is it structured? And then you can put your skill set of what you've learned with computers in that format, right? Of course, if you don't have college, you know, you don't have to put that. You, if you have, you're working on an A plus certification, you put that in the certification, working on A plus certification, A plus certification, CompTIA A plus certification, working on this certification, something to that effect, right? So once you finish that resume, you want to take that ATS style resume and upload it into LinkedIn on Dice.com, Monster.com, at least those three, but I would I would recommend doing on like 10 different ones. People don't listen to me about this. They 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 stop listening after I say resume, and then that's it. They all oh, download your resume, okay, and then that's it. That's all they do. But um, if you do what I'm telling you to do, not only will you find jobs, but eventually as you fill out those, as you add to your profile, as a college, as a high school student, you will get people contacting you about jobs. And if you don't, let me know. Say so you can contact me, you know, my my email is contact at combocourses.com. You can say, hey, I've had my resume out for three weeks, for three months. Nobody's contacting me. You have any other advice? And we could talk about we I just telling you, if you put your stuff out there, somebody will contact you. And you need to be applying for these jobs too. There's jobs that don't require a college degree, they don't require any experience, um, and you can get and and no certification too. But they they need you to know the knowledge, and that's what I'm telling you. Go on YouTube, learn it. Go to CompTIA A plus. Start reading the book. Buy the book. Twenty bucks, thirty bucks. Buy the book and read through it. Study it. Learn it. Take certifications would be the best thing you can do. Take it, pass it. But if you can't. You can still put it on your resume and say you're working on it, right? Because that's still valid. So that's that's what I would do if I was in high school. Somebody said, uh, for someone just coming out of high school, I, I I would look into the Air Force Reserves, get a clear, get the clearance and the security plus, then add certifications and experience and experience from there. Okay, and this is actually a great point. So somebody on YouTube added to what our what our conversation was. And that's to go into the the military. If you have no other options. When I I was so poor that I could only afford to go to community college college on a Pell grant. We had no money. I I was a high school dropout. I had nothing. Um and I was thinking about going into a vocational school, but I was working and going to school, and it was just too hard. 
to do. I just didn't, it was really, really difficult to do it. And um, the, the Air Force was there. My buddy had just come back from the Marines and I talked to him and I said, hey, man, I've been thinking about going to the Marines because I, all I knew was the Marine Corps because we had like a JR, our, our ROTC program had this pure. All I knew was Marines. I knew their rank structure. I knew how they. So that's what I was about to do. He came back from the Marines and he said, don't don't go into the Marines. <laughs> he said, don't go into the Marines. Don't go into the Army. I would suggest the Navy or the Air Force. And I said, well, which one should I do? And he said, well, Air Force has the best one looking women. And I said, okay, well, then I'll go into the Air Force. And so, <laughs> so I went to the Air Force. He said the Air Force had the best facilities. They had the best looking women. You know, I was a 19-year-old kid. And then uh, best everything. So he says, I would recommend maybe the Air Force. And I said, okay. So I, I joined the Air Force and it changed my life. Like the Air Force for all the... Now, they did send me to like three different wars and a combat zone, and I could have got killed. But, you know, it was a different time. It was, you talk about 9-11 happened at, when I was in the military. There was like three different conflicts that they were sending us to. We were going all over the world freaking doing stuff. It was ridiculous. Like I joined at the wrong time. <laughs> so, uh, But um, that being said, it did change my life. I mean, I was able to get a clearance just like Melvin saying here. I was able to get... Uh, Years of experience, really good, hardcore experience with doing real work in both as a cop and in three different fields and in computers. So I was able to do when I got out, I could have done anything. I mean, any of those things. I mean, and then also certifications and degree. I got all those things from the military. So if you have no other options. If you have no other options, you have no money, you have no time, you have nothing. You're not going to go to college. You can't afford it. Then, yes, the military is a great option. And I would highly recommend the Air Force, uh, maybe the Coast Guard. I don't, I don't know much about the Coast Guard, but I would highly recommend um, the the United States Air Force. That's the only one I can speak on because that's the one I was in. But I believe now that I've been doing this longer, there's other options. Like you can actually get into other branches of the federal government. Um, like which ones I, there's a couple of other departments that are reaching out to young people to get in and they're, they're not, they don't go to war zones and stuff. So there's other options. Just look into it and they pay for your degree. They pay for your, you know, all that stuff. So that is an option. All right, guys, I think that's it. I've been talking for about two and a half hours, but I appreciate everybody joining me. Thank you guys for uh, all of the couple of donations. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for all the participation. I never expected any of this. The site's been growing. The community has been growing. If you guys are interested in following me offline and knowing a lot more, going way deeper, join my newsletter. It's as simple as download my resume. Once you download it, it'll send you, you know, you have to, the price of entry is your email. But what I do is on my newsletter, I send out jobs. I've been trying to do this once a week. I Sometimes I'll send out my book for free because Amazon will give me, hey, you can send out these free books or I'll just send out my own free books. So I, these are things I do to my newsletter. So if you are interested in really going deeper into this, if you're very serious about all this stuff, if you like what I'm saying, join my newsletter. That's how I talk to my community. My community is, my, is the newsletter. So you can follow me also on you know uh, YouTube, on Facebook, on on uh on TikTok of course but the best way to, for us to interact is definitely on the newsletter and definitely on um on uh, LinkedIn you can join me on LinkedIn as well and that's it guys thank you so much for watching thanks everybody who had comments about it and i am out of here